Okay. Right. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, good morning and welcome to everybody to uh, our Transport for the North meeting. Um, I was just reflecting earlier on this morning that our last meeting was on the 30th of June. Uh, at that stage, Boris Johnson hadn't announced that he was going to resign. Uh, there have been a few changes in the subsequent period. Um, and uh, we now find ourselves with a new Secretary of State for Transport uh, and also a new uh, Secretary of State for DCLUG, both of which are members of Parliament situated well and truly in the north. So uh, hopefully that might uh, give us uh, a bit more access to uh, some of the people that we want to uh, speak to. And uh, I've already written to uh, Anne-Marie Trevelyan, um, reminding her of my visit with her to look at the A1 some years ago when I had responsibility for uh, transport policy. So uh, we can reflect on some old memories uh, when we hopefully meet up in the not too distant uh, future. Um, but uh, welcome everybody um, this morning. Uh, I just want to hand over at the moment, if I can, to Julie just to explain a few things. Um, this is a very grand, fantastic room, but I do feel a bit remote from everybody and I, although my glasses are quite good, I can't see all the name tags, so I might have a bit of problems absolutely identifying everybody at the appropriate time. But I know we've got a few people who are late um, because of uh, train connections, which is no doubt something we're going to discuss a little later on. Uh, Julie, can I come across to you? Oh, by the way, just one notice, please. When you're speaking, uh, or when you call on to speak, if you can press the red button in front of you, then that will mean the camera will come on to you uh, and obviously take it off when you're no longer speaking. I think that was the instructions I was uh, given. Uh, Julie, over to you. Yes, thank you, Chairman, and, and for, for those remarks. Um, in terms of the quorum, we do have 10 members here at the moment, which satisfies that part of our quorum requirements. Um, they also require that um, to be core, the board needs to have at least 50% of the weighted vote. At the moment, we are slightly short of that in terms of the, uh, the, the members' vote holdings. We have 40 out of 44. We do have a further member. I understand Mayor Burnham is due to attend uh, at a later stage, in which case we'll be absolutely fine on both of those scores. Uh, but it is possible under the procedure rules uh, for board to, on, on a, a, mo a notice without motion, to decide to suspend temporarily the need to have the, uh, the 44 votes. Uh, so I would suggest, Chairman, that if a member is prepared to put that motion forward and that's seconded and agreed by the board, um, that will be a way to allow us to move forward until we have the further member here. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I, I propose what Julie said. And, se and secondly, just in front. Thanks very much indeed, Martin. Thank you. Uh, excellent. Thank you. Um, d d I have to ask if there are any declarations of interest. One that I've got, which is uh, already on the register of interest, is that I am chairman of Airlines UK, which is a trade body for the airline for airline companies, not airports, but airlines, uh, and that is formally uh, registered. Are there any others? Yeah, my name is Amir Hussain. Um, my company, Yemi Tech, is involved in the Southern Gateway Scheme in Bradford um, for the through station. So I just wanted to declare that. Thank you for that. Okay. Uh, right. Can we then uh, move on to uh, the uh, minutes held, to approve the minutes held on the 30th of June? I may have to come back later on, but uh, I don't believe there are any particular points uh, out of that. Uh, Martin, do you just want to take us through any points relevant? Um, thank you, Chairman, and good morning, uh, members. Um, uh, no, in terms of the actions from the meeting held on the 30th of June, um, they've all been taken forward. So we've published the business plan. Um, you wrote, Chairman, as uh, on behalf of the Board to the Secretary of State uh, with regards to HS2, including things like the Goldborn link, and indeed there was a letter from yourself to both the new Prime Minister and the new Secretary of State, both of which are in the, the, uh, the papers pack. Uh, you've also got, uh, later on today, you, we responded to uh, the legislation, the draft uh, legislation on GBR, we've responded um, following consultation with members there. So I think in terms of um, actions, we have covered off those actions. Uh, we're expecting uh, Councillor Denise Rollo um, to attend today. Um, she's from um, Cumberland, the Shadow Authority. If you remember, the board uh, agreed to invite representatives from the Shadow Authorities to come along and observe if they were, if were so minded. Uh, hopefully, um, we'll be joined by uh, Councillor Rollo. Thank you. 
Can I just give her apologies, Chair? She, uh, she let me know last night that she wasn't able to come today. Sorry, I can pass those on. Okay, thank you for that. That will be duly noted. Um, because um, of uh, slight transportation problems uh, for the Department of Transport, I, I want to change slightly the agenda around. And I'm going to sort of take items four and five a little later on because certain people were booked on a train this morning which was cancelled, which we might want to talk a bit more about later on anyway. Um, so um, if it's okay, I'd like to skip, and I should have said this at the beginning, to uh, item number six, which is the uh, socially inclusive transport strategy. Um, and I'm going to ask uh, Tim to... Tom to uh, take us through this. Tom has done all the work on it, so uh, Tim is rightly uh, letting him uh, uh, present the paper this morning. So, uh, Tom, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, today we're seeking board support to publish the uh, draft socially inclusive transport strategy and to undertake consultation on this. The strategy sets out TFN's vision for an inclusive transport system and the policy steps that are required to achieve this. This includes defining TFN's role and the broader policy agenda that's necessary for significant progress on this issue. The role defined for TFN focuses on expanding and sharing rigorous evidence on inclusive transport, raising the profile of this issue, and providing practical support to partners in developing and targeting transport interventions. A key element of this is a data tool that provides a systematic means of identifying local areas where there's both high vulnerability to social exclusion and poor access to key destinations with the transport options available. And this allows a rigorous comparison across the whole of England. This tool was published alongside our research report last week, and the strategy commits to further development in this capability, including understanding how and why this risk is changing over time. The key results from this have attracted some significant media coverage and also some positive response from partners. And the strategy moves us on from a description of the problem to an evidence-based policy agenda to address it. This includes a set of priorities for active travel, road travel and public transport, linked variously to local authorities, DFT operators and other stakeholders. Reflecting our evidence base, a significant element of this policy agenda is focused on the role of local bus services as vital social infrastructure for communities and the direct link that can be drawn from the cost, coverage and reliability of bus services to social and economic inequalities. Through consultation, we're looking to verify and expand on this policy agenda, ensuring that it provides a comprehensive response to the problem. Within this consultation, we will particularly seek to engage with organisations and stakeholders that work with the population groups that our research shows are most at risk of social exclusion because of transport issues. And this particularly includes people with disabilities and long-term health conditions, those on low incomes and insecure work, and those with care and responsibilities. We'll also seek responses from organisations, stakeholders and the public in the area types where our research shows there is the highest risk of transport-related social exclusion. This includes coastal communities, small towns and cities, and those on the peripheries of our major cities. The strategy also sets out the means by which we'll monitor progress towards a more inclusive transport system, something which hasn't been previously possible at the regional level. Our baseline position is that 3.3 million people in the north live in areas in which there is a high risk of social exclusion, specifically because of issues with the transport system. Our strategy targets a reduction in the size of this population, but also a reduction in the inequality between the three regions of the north and a reduction in the gap between the north and the rest of England. And the consultation will include these headline objectives, which defines the overall scope of the ambition. And finally, this strategy will form a key part of the next strategic transport plan. We're using this work to inform the place and population framework, as well as the case for change, significantly enhancing the level of detail on the societal impacts of the transport system. In this regard, the overall commitment to health, inclusion, and access to opportunities for all is the same as in the 2019 SDP, but we can now be much more specific on the challenges and the solutions based on our new evidence base and the draft strategy. And with the board's approval, we'll progress to consultation by the end of 2022 when we'll bring the revised strategy back to this board in early 2023. Thank you. Tom, shall we? 
Thank you, Mr Chairman, and uh, thank you very much, Tom, and everybody who's uh, put this report together. I think it's, it's a really great piece of work, and I think it's something that we should definitely be more mindful of when we are putting together the business cases for future inve infrastructure investment. This should be one of the things that is considered in that business case planning process. Um, in terms of what we could do to make transport more socially inclusive, I think anything that we can continue to do to try and drive down the price. So I think in, when it comes to bus travel, we're starting to really see some interesting work on fares. But I think we need to really have a strong voice on rail fares. And we need to make sure that, that, make, that rail fares are not priced out for, for, for people. It's not too expensive for people to be able to travel by rail. And also, something that's not ever really touched upon or talked about is the price of car insurance, especially for young people. And why is it that it's actually more expensive to insure your car in the north of England than it is in the south? <clears throat> um, I'd just like the report to focus a little um, on some of the particular issues that we face in rural communities. I think it's so important that that is kind of highlighted, is that it's really easy to have great active travel when your place of work or your university or school or college is so close to you but when you've got a five mile ten mile journey to get to where you need to get to it's a lot harder you can't just walk there so I do think that I'd be really grateful for some work could be done to have a more acute awareness of the particular issues of rural areas but on the whole this is a really great piece of work and I think this is again a great example of transport for the north showing what it can do. Uh, thank you. Uh, I've got quite a list now, so I'll try and get round. That's, that's uh, excellent. Um, Peter Cannon first. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to echo what Charlie has said. It's an excellent piece of work. From a LEP perspective, it gives us um, really helpful data and, uh, and information because uh, social exclusion is a key part of delivering on our strategic economic plan uh, for greener, fairer growth. Um, we talked at the last meeting um, to, to include as much as possible about buses in the TFM business plan for the year. Uh, and this is a really good example of how TFM can help uh, local areas uh, to um, help in discussions with government to do with um, these sort of issues. My only concern is that the statistics quoted are perhaps getting worse even as we speak um, because we, ha we are seeing huge cuts to bus services. Uh, the statistics I've seen most recently in South Yorkshire are 14% cut. Uh, I know West Yorkshire quoted 11%. So um, it's a vital piece of work, but it's now what we do with it that's important to try and influence and to make the changes that are needed. Thank you. Um, Mayor, Dis Mayor Driscoll. Thank you. Uh, I also welcome the report. It's excellent. I'm particularly pleased to see item number eight in there, safety. Um, as public sector administrators as LEPs, we have a tendency to look very often at the finances of this, and this is looking very much at the psychology of it. If we are going to grow the public transport market, that perception of safety matters, because there are plenty of people who may be financially not in peril, who still are socially excluded from public transport, particularly late at night. And I would like to just uh, to put on record that we need to be thinking about the staff in these industries as well. Bus drivers late at night on their own um, are not nightclub bouncers and they're not paid to be nightclub bouncers. Um, all sorts of rapid transport systems are tiny and we are metro again. So let's make sure that we are looking after the workers on these industries as well, please. Thank you. That's a very good point. Uh, Councillor Duncan. Um, thank you. Yeah, I welcome the report too. Um, and certainly in terms of the start of the launch of the consultation, I think it is really useful research that will hopefully guide um, future strategy to address um, social exclusion. Um, I do have some concerns, however, about the methodology and looking at the map, um, the data map and the results of that. 
it shows that while there are areas of the Yorkshire coast which have a high risk of um, exclusion, the rest of the rural part of North Yorkshire and other rural parts of, of counties um, are all green, which may give a sort of misleading impression that always rosy in these rural areas that there is not um, social exclusion. However, we know um, from our day-to-day -day work that people living in those rural areas are potentially the the most likely to be socially excluded by nature of the geography and limited access to services. Um, rural poverty really is an acute um, issue in the hardest to reach areas in North Yorkshire and elsewhere across um, other parts of the North. So um, it was really just a challenge out there that um, the methodology that's been used may well be giving an impression that all is well and it may well not be the case in some of the most rural parts of the North. Okay, thanks for Thanks for that. Uh, I'll, I'll ask Tom to uh, sort of sum up on some of the issues that have come up uh, uh, towards the end of the meeting. I think, Councillor Little, did you? Yeah, it's Mike. Mike's working now. Um, I, I mean, I, I cannot disagree with any of what my colleagues uh, have already said. Uh, living in uh, rural Cumbria, um, the bus services are commercially run. Um, and immediately they're not commercial, they're stopped. Um, the County Council often gets blamed for them being stopped because we're not subsidising buses, but after 11 years of austerity, uh, we can't just do that. We have other uh, more important needs for our public. Uh, but can I just make the point that the car isn't the villain in all of this? It's, it, the, ca the car um, in, in rural is like Cumbria, means that people can get to work uh, on time, people can move about to do their job. Uh, and again, many young people now are uh, passing tests at 17 and 18. Uh, and again, the point that uh, my colleague Charlie makes about the cost of insurance uh, is something that should be taken into account. But the car's not the villain here. Uh, if we don't have the cars to move about, uh, then we will bring um, our societies to stagnation. Um, the buses are an issue. Working with the bus companies has been difficult. We know that through the smart ticketing program that we tried to do for three or four years and then we had to lose the funding on it. Um, the rail industry at the moment um, I don't see is getting any better than it was ten years ago when we started out on this journey. In fact in some areas it's getting worse. So social exclusion is likely to get worse, and again, it will be due to the, the factor of the cost of living at the moment. Uh, people in need get about to do the shopping, uh, and as shops close in smaller villages, in smaller towns, people are going to have to travel further. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, yes. <laughs> yeah, brilliant, thank you. Um, uh, I really welcome the report and I think that it's a really valuable piece of work. As a new member and somebody who maybe is coming at this from a slightly different perspective, um, I wonder to what extent concepts around walkable neighbourhoods and 15 minute cities, 20 minute cities um, are the things that really will unlock the, the capacity of social inclusion. And if we can understand what the things are that are missing from those areas that are causing the transport movements because those things people are not fulfilled within their, their walkable neighbourhoods, gives us an opportunity to start understanding why people are taking those, those transport routes. And I think if we could take a look at that perspective, it starts to become, um, we, I think we start going upstream in terms of the problems. And I think once we start looking at the uh, place-based issues, and I, I welcome the fact that there's um, the, the approach around um, targeting um, <coughs> disadvantaged groups through the organisations that are on the ground. But I think really understanding who's on the ground and not waiting for them to come forward is really important. I mean, just to give you an example, we did some work in Bradford and found that in the last three years, there's been 176 public consultations. And <coughs> this sort of sense that people are consulted to death without things happening, is, is a really key one. And I think that understanding that local place-based uh, perspective and which organisations are, are um, representing the most underrepresented groups and targeting them, I think will just be a really powerful way to try and get that inclusivity that we seek and sort of do it from a place-based approach. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Ross. 
<laughs> Thank you. Yes. So uh, again, welcome the report um, from a more urban uh, perspective, uh, recognising also the challenges in the cities as well, uh, particularly when it comes to access to service provision, uh, particularly buses and the concerns there. So. Um, welcome the sort of intent i guess for me it would be helpful to have more of the background data at a local level particularly through the consultation process so that as part of that people can see the impact uh, that it is for them on in their local area as well thank you thanks mike um sorry the gentleman there yeah thank you chair um I think that this report is, is, is timely, um, and, and I'm really pleased to see that it refers to the health and well-being um, benefits of, of, of this particular program. Um, I, I mean, I, I certainly would ask that the authors of the report uh, consult widely with uh, directors of public health and uh, with the, the emerging integrated care systems as well in all of our areas, because uh, there's no two ways about it that if we're going to get in front of uh, the health challenges within the system as a whole, then we've got to deal with the wider determinants of health. And certainly, um, lack of access to transport, lack of access to connectivity is, is a very significant factor in that. So, so from that point of view, uh, I really do welcome the report. Um, in terms of buses, um, my area is predominantly, it's North Lincolnshire, predominantly rural. And uh, rural transport is a real issue. And I think just the notion of putting on more scheduled buses, throwing money at the problem, probably isn't the answer for rurality. Uh, and I think maybe the report needs to look more innovatively at uh, technological solutions, such as the common use of electric vehicles. Uh, so all I would ask is, can we look in widest possible uh, sense at providing some kind of communal transport in rural areas? Thanks, Chair. Mark, did you want to come in on this? Please, Chair. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, cle clearly, the, the, there is absolutely nothing to dislike about this report, and, and I echo all of the sentiments that's, that's been put forward. Um, <clears throat> just, to, just to play, I mean, if, 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 we, if we can address this issue, then there are huge economic benefits to flow through. And <clears throat> I don't think that point is made strongly enough in, in, in the um, report to date. So I'd, I'd just like that to be picked up, and, and in terms of consultation, a lot of the interaction needs to, of, that, of, of that consultation needs to take place with the business community because a lot of that is, is, is interdependent. So just, just a, an observation, really. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Liam, do you, you want me to come in? Is there anybody I've missed, by the way, you, just before I've got everybody? Okay, Liam. Yeah, no, thanks very much. It was just to make the point very specifically about affordability because very much in the current economic circumstances and the cost of living crisis that we face, affordability is absolutely key. Um, but in order to sort of keep public transport affordable and good value and, and frankly cheap, because that's what we should always be, be targeting, that will always set two key ingredients. One is the right funding package for the public transport industry, the rail industry and, and the bus industry accordingly but the second component is the right regulatory framework now a regulatory framework does exist for the rail network but at this moment in time it doesn't within the kind of uh, the bus network now within the big city regions those regions that are pursuing bus franchising so my own region the liverpool city region or greater manchester and other places that will address that point in the medium to longer term but in the short term but also in those areas that don't choose to pursue a franchised approach and that's completely their, their prerogative there actually isn't any kind of price regulation or consumer champion frankly to protect people on, on the point of price and the reason I think that's very very prescient at this moment in time is laudably the government are going to be rolling out a national scheme from January to March next year of a £2 capped fare right across the country but the risk with that is a lot of people will get a short-term reduction, but in March may well then see a massive hike in fares again, going from what will be a temporary two pounds, potentially up to four, five, six or more pounds. So there probably is a very good short-term opportunity here to argue for an appropriate price regulator, consumer champion structure for the bus industry to actually avoid those kind of price cliffs, because 
if we're being dead honest about it, it's one of the few predominantly privatised industries that actually has no price regulation in it. Electric, gas, water, other utilities and public services that were sold off do have that um, price protection. Buses never did do, and now's a really pr important time probably to seek to reintroduce that. Uh, thanks, sir. I, I think the, uh, the, the three-month sort of trial period will be a very interesting uh, trial period, and it's also to ensure that the bus companies uh, sort of play their part in it as well in, in those three months. Uh, I, th I think that is vitally important. Uh, okay, um, Tom, do you want to just summarise and take any points, particularly address those, uh, and also just possibly take us on to where you think we're going for the next report on this? Thank you very much, everyone, uh, for your comments. Uh, I'll, I'll address a, a couple of the specific points raised um, on the data sharing. Uh, that is that is available now. So, if that is uh, useful with regards to consultations, uh, the open underlying data from from the tool that's that's widely mentioned and cited within the uh, the paper and the draft strategy is uh, is available to share now. That is entirely open data, and that was one of the development principles uh, for our work on this. Um, I very much appreciate the challenge around rural areas, particularly the, the most dispersed and low density rural communities. Um, it's something that is that is analytically complex uh, to address, and I, I feel that perhaps presentationally the fact that rural, the most rural areas are often highlighted in green within a map implies something that we are very much not trying to imply. In fact, the rural urban fringe category is by far the highest risk of the urban, urban rural categories within our work. And our evidence strongly shows that those on low incomes and insecure work and those with disabilities and long-term health conditions within rural areas are likely to be at far higher risk of TRC than those in relatively denser urban areas. Um, so I, I will change and improve the presentation around the, uh, the comments on rural communities and also consider uh, changing the presentation within the data tool so that one isn't greeted with a, uh, a, a sea of greens, I believe someone put it, um, when viewing some, uh, viewing some rural areas. On the point of engaging with directors uh, of public health, very keen to include those within the, uh, within the consultation. Also note that we have uh, recently completed a piece of research on transport health and well-being and that officials from OHID were involved uh, in the development of that and uh, that will be a policy position rather based on that research will be coming to this board in December. Uh, on the role of car access, I, I very much hope that the strategy doesn't come across as being uh, opposed to car use and car access, but rather prioritizing access to alternatives and making sure that people are not locked into car dependency and car use when it is very difficult and unaffordable for them to maintain that. And that is something that came across very uh, prominently within our, within our research on this. And the points on uh, DRT and, uh, sorry, demand responsive transport and um, community transport options, including sharing of electric vehicles, is something that I will make more prominent within the, uh, within the current draft strategy. Uh, I, I hope that addresses, addresses your points. And I'll take a uh, revised version of this to consultation based on your feedback. Is there anything you feel I've, I've missed within that? No, I think, uh, I think you've covered all the points. If everybody's content with those course of action uh, for future uh, reference back to us. So just uh, to confirm there, content we consult. Uh, can we just take uh, that that you are content that we go out to consultation on the document as the document is ours uh, formal uh, position at the moment? Okay, I see general agreement to that. Fine, thank you. Um, what I'm going to do now is take item number seven, uh, and then we'll go back to uh, taking the uh, the uh, integrated uh, uh, rail plan and also the Trans Pennine um, upgrade. Uh, but Martin, can I hand over to you for connected mobility, please, and item seven? Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, this is this is this is this, the reason we brought this to you today because it actually quite nicely flows from that conversation you've just had around the social transport, uh, the socially inclusive transport strategy. Um, 
members will remember you uh, had a conversation uh, back early in March of this year where you were um, reacting to uh, the conversations that we'd had with individual partners. There was this sense that there was a role for t Transport for the North to play in helping deliver connected mobility. Uh, and in particular, if we think about the future travel scenario where it highlighted the importance, as many of the members have highlighted in the preceding conversation, around the importance of local buses as part of that connected mobility. Um, so you've got before you the paper which kind of summarised where we came from and actually highlights that one of the issues facing uh, many authorities, not all authorities, but many authorities, is this issue about uh, capability and capacity, about access to uh, pr uh, particular expertise, support for taking forward um, uh, pieces of work to actually uh, put in place the connected mobility. Now, as part of the in-year funding that we secured from the department last year, and which is being delivered this year, uh, we have started to take that work forward, working with uh, a couple of the local partners, uh, in particular one that springs to mind as we've been doing some work with York about how we can help them uh, and take forward some of this. And in doing so, uh, what we've been doing is obviously uh, drawing on some of the knowledge and the experience that we've got from the Integrated Smart Ticketing Programme, because there was a lot of good work done there around agreements and uh, legal arrangements, which we can actually, um, I think in the vernacular, is, is boilerplate, sort of have that knowledge and then work with partners about how we can apply it. Um, and so this is a really kind of an opportunity just to make the board aware of this role that Transport for the North has in supporting its existing partners. Uh, it's an opportunity just to kind of remind members that there is that activity. And if they are uh, aspects of their own work, and as I said, it's not everywhere um, that has this uh, challenge, um, then um, can come forward to, uh, to work with us. Um, you'll also no notice in the report a, a reference about the work we're doing around pay-as-you-go. Members will remember one of the aspects about the integrated rail plan was a, a reference to introducing pay-as-you-go in parts of the north, and it's something that as, as a board you've wanted to promote. And so there is opportunity through the work of the Rail North Committee to do that. Uh, and one final point just to uh, make members aware of, uh, you'll be familiar with our analytical capacity and capability, and we're at the moment just in the process of securing some work which will actually bring much of the bus route and bus information into that data set, so adding to the knowledge. And what that will allow us to do in due course is to develop tools that then can be used by individual partners to do some of the modelling that members have touched on, Chair, uh, earlier. So understanding what would be the impact, what would be the, uh, the growth in pub bus patronage if certain things were happening in their particular location. So adding to that support. So Chair, it's really there just as an opportunity to brief members about what we're doing, uh, an opportunity for members to identify any further opportunities, uh, and an opportunity to kind of build on this as we move forward. Okay, thank you, Martin. Uh, point down here. Well, right, I think uh, I've got to make a obviously welcome the report, but I'd like to also make a request for Warrington to be involved in the multi operating ticketing. We'd like to be a part of that process and obviously working with other authorities nearby. We want to look at uh, cross border with other authorities on, on the one ticket to see the possibilities of that, but we also want to be a part of the multi operating ticketing. So it's a request for Warrington, basically. Uh, Craig. Thank you, Chair. It's just a brief question, if I may. Um, page 62, section 4.3 of the report sets out that the pilot is engaging and supporting with authorities. Um, my officers have just asked me to flag that they are unaware of there having been any contact to date with Cheshire East Council. Uh, please could that be uh, clarified? Thank you. Okay, Any, anybody else on this? Martin, do you just want to touch on those couple of points? I think cross-border use of tickets is so important, I can't disagree. It's, uh, it, it is vitally important. But Martin. Uh, Chairman, on both of those points, we'll pick them up uh, separately outside the meeting. I think that was partly the point of this, 
bringing this report to raise awareness amongst the board as a whole of this um, relationship that we have or this opportunity and then to identify whether there are further opportunities. Um, Chairman, we're just about to start our, our business planning process for the next year and actually understanding where there is uh, opportunity to support our partners, certainly something we want to understand. And then the conversations we're having with um, uh, with, um, with colleagues at the department where, um, just going back just briefly to the preceding item where a number of members made the importance of understanding the social and the environmental aspects when we're promoting uh, investments in both transport and services. And I think, I think it's fair to say that's an agenda that the new ministerial team is interested in and it's an opportunity we need to use our evidence to do. So we will certainly pick up with uh, Councillor Brown and Councillor Mundy and your authorities to make forward um, and also to see about how we uh, make sure we have that continuity across boundaries. Okay, thank you. Um, right, I'm now going back to uh, item four on the agenda um, because we're going to now uh, have a bit of discussion on the integrated uh, uh, rail plan, the Transport Select Committee report, which was published uh, just before the, uh, on the 19th of July. I must say as a report, it's a report that uh, if we'd have written it, we probably wouldn't have uh, improved much on it. It's a, a very uh, good report and one that I think we would give uh, a, a lot of credence to. Um, there are certain time scales set in the report. They, the government will have to do a response to that report, but that might be delayed uh, because of obvious changes which have come to, through the departmental team. But Tim, do you want to uh, start the discussion on this report and uh, then I'll take comments after that. Thank you, Chair, and uh, good morning, Board. I did have some slides to put up, if, that's, if it's possible to now get them up. Um, I'm going to talk to these briefly. We will circulate them after. Part of the, part of the rationale for producing some slides is that clearly things are moving relatively quickly. Um, so what's covered in the paper, and I'll take the paper as read, is really the detailed findings and recommendations from, uh, as Patrick said, a very helpful report from the Transport Select Committee in July, um, which aligned very strongly with the evidence that TFN uh, provided and, and the position that this board has taken in respect to the integrated rail plan. So I'm, I'm very happy to pick up the sort of the next steps on the Transport Select Committee work. but. Um, what, what Martin and I thought we might do today um, is um, clearly uh, things have moved through the summer since the board last met in June, as well as the TSC report. We've also had commitment from, from the new Prime Minister to deliver an NPR in full. Uh, there was a, um, a, a, a NPR was included in the list of accelerated schemes um, published alongside the mini budget last week. We clearly do not know at this point uh, and have no, had no more further detail about the government's view of uh, what NPR in full uh, means and nor do we yet not know what the implications and indeed if there are any for the changes to HS2 that were announced as part of the integrated rail plan. Still a, so there's still quite a degree of uncertainty. What we have been clear about, and, and the Chair has written on behalf of the Board to the new Prime Minister, is what NPR means in full from a TFM perspective, because as the Board will know, we have had very um, uh, clear processes for agreeing that with you, and, um, uh, uh, and until you tell us otherwise, that position, that position uh, will be the TFM position. Um, uh, we do think there are opportunities now to, to move this forward, and that was partly what we wanted to talk to you about today. Um, so I will skip through these, but we will circulate them after. Uh, and I think most of you, and indeed the board, has talked about these these maps before. This is this is the, the investment in the, in the integrated rail plan, focusing primarily on on Liverpool to York corridor. Um, uh, with a with a less clear commitment to the northeast and um, and clear corridors, um, particularly around Sheffield, Hull, and Bradford, left left entirely open. Um, uh, so I, I think we've got a clear understanding of where the IRP has left us, and indeed this board has a very clear view of what NPR in full is that that network of um, fast. Uh, 
connections between city centres, fast and frequent delivering turn up and go connectivity through a series of new lines and, and significant upgrades. Um, through what of course will be a major programme of investment but would deliver that interconnected um, interdependent northern economy which is right at the heart of um, TFN strategic transport plan so that, that requirement to create an NPR network it is still really fundamental and still required and on a corridor by corridor basis we have a clear view of what that means um, but critically bringing into uh, the network uh, a new line via Bradford the connections to Hull, as I said, the connections to Sheffield, um, those, those are the things where really recreating the, the NPR network back to preferred one um, must, must be a priority now. Um, and again, that, that is a map we are all familiar with that creates that inter, interconnected, interdependent north. Um, in, terms of what, in terms of where we go next, we know that work has started. Uh, following the IRP and government is with with technical support from TFN uh, producing uh, a revised business case based on the IRP core network uh, and that's due to complete next year work has already started through network rail um, uh, on um, to develop some of the um, some elements of it for example things like this Radford the terms of reference for the Lee's HS study um, that we discussed at board in June uh, remain unpublished and I think um, from what, what we've heard from the department is that will still take a bit of time um, given there are new, um, and new ministers and, and parliament and recess before we see that but clearly that, that is a priority area. Um, uh, in terms of where we go next though um, uh, in our view there are um, as well as working with the department to accelerate the proposals in the IRP uh, and making sure that where there is areas of clear consensus uh, that we're working collaboratively with the department to, to accelerate that um, but also being able to reopen the options um, and going back to the evidence base which already exists particularly around the engineering side there's probably a bit more work to do around um, the analytics but absolutely some more work to do around the interaction with HS2 but fundamentally the engineering evidence that's required um, to look at these options again is, is still there so we will work with your officers now to, on the on the steps that are, um, that are needed to um, to do that bring that together in a set of recommendations um, for government um, I, I think particularly once Patrick has met with the Secretary of State and we understand a bit more about where the department's intentions are, uh, are going post IRP. As Patrick said, they're, they're, uh, a government response to the Transport Select Committee report, um, I, th I believe, should have been produced by the end of September, of which we are now extremely close. So it's likely there will be a delay given, given wider events. Um, but there is the opportunity, we think, now to, to, to move all of this forward. Uh, and in particular, I think, over the next, over the next 12 to 18 months. So, uh, that's where we are, Chair. I'll um, pause, having talked much longer than I intended to, as usual, and open it to questions. Okay. Uh, We've got quite a few. Okay, um, let's uh, let's start with uh, Liam first, uh, and then. No, brilliant. Thanks very much, and thanks for uh, a very good report uh, there, Tim. I'm particularly pleased with the sort of the letter that went from, from the chairman to, to the government. I think that was particularly kind of um, pointed, and, and absolutely kind of made all the right sort of points. Um, I appreciate today's probably a very tough day for the Prime Minister, so let me give her a little bit of respite, in the sense that on Northern Powerhouse Rail, I believe she's right. You know, the pledge she made as part of her kind of leadership pitch uh, to be leader of the Conservative Party and thus Prime Minister is that the full Northern Powerhouse Rail network, as preferred by TFN, would be built. That was her pledge. And I think it's equally opportune because this week we've had the Labour Party conference and the Labour Party has confirmed that a future Labour government would construct the HS2 network in full and the Northern Powerhouse Rail network in full. From a TFM perspective, I think the kind of question I wanted to, to ask is, 
what is going to be our lobbying and communication strategy from here on in? Because it seems we've got political consensus, which is brilliant. How do we make sure that becomes a reality, particularly as we now we're into that kind of final maximum two years before a general election, maybe sooner than that? So now is an absolute key time to make sure that things that have been pledged during political campaigns get into manifestos, but then crucially change the work program of the DFT because you know, the map that we've got up there it was highlighted in red I think it is a red line for the north of England and certainly from the Liverpool City region's perspective we fully support that full network so what's our planned approach over the next year or so just to make sure that the DFT ultimately changes course and our preferred network is what is delivered I'm not quite sure what you meant about my letter being pointed. I just thought it was uh, uh, nearly straightforward. Uh, Mayor Driscoll. Thank you. Support everything Liam has just said. The core purpose of TFN is about the economic prosperity of the North. And we've collectively chosen to interpret that as being also inclusive and environmentally sustainable. Uh, it won't have escaped anybody's notice that on Friday the government uh, made a number of announcements relating to growth, but we are not going to see any economic success in the north if we're unable to move people and goods around. And on that, uh, DFE, DFT officials can't get here because trains are cancelled. Um, every time I try to travel across the north on train, and I only use public transport, there's a train cancelled because of driver shortages, because of signal failures, because of something. The commitment to NPR in full, we should not forget that we actually have very serious problems now. And one of the things we need to do is, and it just since it doesn't fit anywhere else in the agenda, we really need to commit to that driver training and an academy for the north. So it would be great if that could appear in the minutes. Um, because every time trains are cancelled, it damages confidence, it damages modal shift, and it harms our ability to grow our economy. So on NPR in full, the original intention, of course, was to connect all the great cities of the north and their rural hinterlands, and that includes opening up the Leam side line. And as we saw on the little map up there. Um, once you get north of York, people seem, to see, people seem to think the north is somewhere between Sheffield and York. And as someone who lives in Newcastle, that looks like the south to me. Um, so what we need to do is make sure that uh, we, we understand that east-west connectivity for us is the same as north-south connectivity. Everything goes up that four bits of metal that is the two tracks north of Nathalaton, and that needs to be opened up to the Leam sideline. There are two million people in the northeast. That's around 13% of the population of the north. It's quite significant. And so can we, on that strategy, absolutely um, support Liam's, Liam's uh, suggestion that we really need a very strong lobbying strategy. Uh, and as a cross-party body, I think we're well placed to do that. Um, we have a chair who's very well connected, who I think uh, is one of the reasons we're very keen to get him. So uh, let's make the full use of that as well. And I know uh, you've been doing that. Thank you very much, Patrick. But in anything that goes out, my concern is that when we say east-west connectivity, that we do not mention the northeast. So even in a lot of these letters, no as it say Leam side line. So could I ask the officers to just have a standard copy and paste phrase, and if you can't think of anything else, say, and by the way, the Leam side line, because if I don't mention it, Jamie Driscoll and Martin Gannon are going to pick me up on it. Okay, thank you uh, very much indeed. I think we've got that message, or we will have now. Uh, sorry, who was... Uh, my, my, my cross. Well, I mean, to pick up uh, on a similar thing around the east, really. So, uh, in my view, the east doesn't stop at York either. And you know, the line to Hull uh, is very important to us, of course, in terms of this and the, the, the need for electrification. So, I was reassured that the point was covered in the presentation that wasn't covered in the papers around the position being supporting the electrification of uh, the line from, from Hull. 
Uh, but you know, I'm very keen to make sure that, that is uh, the position that carries forward uh, from this and that that is, continues to be the case that's put to the government. Um, because actually there is a potential easy win for them if they were to pursue that agenda, actually. And it could be done and it could be an actual achievement that they could get uh, uh, for this region. So uh, more reassured by the presentation uh, after seeing that. I uh, just want to make sure that the, the continued push for that uh, electrification takes place. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Ross. I, I, I mean, I think the, uh, the the point that we also have to acknowledge is that these schemes, by their very nature, do take a long time in implementation. Uh, and uh, but the planning also is very, very important. Not least, I mean, we'll come on to uh, Transpennine upgrade uh, next. And I think uh, while I would certainly want to agree what uh, Mayor Drisco said as far as the one of the most important things as far as confidence by the travelling public is reliability. And once you start getting services cut at very short notice, there's nothing that uh, dents passenger confidence more than that lack of reliability uh, as far as things are, are going. So uh, I think that's a very important point. Um, and I think Councillor Brown, Brown next. Thank you, Chair, and can I also thank you for your, your two letters, both to the Prime Minister and to the Secretary of State. Uh, clearly, I particularly welcome in the latter uh, your reference to discussions with officials in relation to the crew superhub. Um, however, the report itself doesn't indicate whether the crew superhub uh, was a main consideration for the Select Committee. So I would just appreciate uh, some clarification on that. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, Hans Wendry? Yes, thank you. Yes, good, good report. And it's uh, probably, let's get back to where we sort of started from with this. It's uh, what we've got in front of us delivers what we want to be delivered, but it's not what we set out. It wasn't our original plans, our vision for the, for the North at all. But it's like the watered-down version of what we actually wanted. What we're saying is we'll have to make do with what we can get. But what I'd like to see now is some timelines put in place. When's work going to start? When are we going to get some commitment and say, this scheme's going to start on this date? I think that needs to be on a timeline what's going to happen. Bear in mind, some schemes can be done quicker than others. Do we need some quick wins? Do we need to say we can deliver that quick, quicker than other schemes? To, to show, get some confidence built up with the people of the North again to say, this is actually some, not a talking shop that keeps going round in circles and re-looking really at things again, but actually starts delivering for the people of the North and delivers what, what they need. Um, so I think we've probably waited long enough to get something done, done in the North there. This is, this is not what we, our vision, but this is something that we'll, we'll go along with and make, to make do with what we've got. But at least give us something out of this now. I get very nervous when we say we're going to re-look at some parts of the projects. Every time anything's being re-looked at, we come worse off. So what we wanted, or what we suggested we wanted to get, we didn't get. We, we got a, a watered-down version of it. So when you get comments like, we're going to revisit some of the schemes again, that sort of, my, my mind starts ticking over. Are they going to try and save some money on this scheme? We're going to get another cheaper version on the cheaper version we got in the first place. And uh, on a positive note, Golden Link side, I think, wants to offer any support it can and help with the uh, local issues. Uh, Martin Gallon next. Sorry, my, my apologies. The, um, I, I agree with everything that's been said. Now, particularly, the last comments was said that we need to get ahead. You know, let, let's, let's celebrate. I mean, we were enormously disappointed at the conclusion of the integrated rail review, but now we're in find ourselves in a position where the current government has announced, and the Prime Minister announced, they are firmly committed to the full delivery of, the no of Northern Powerhouse Rail. And we've heard from Liam... I wasn't able to make it to Liverpool uh, this week, but the, if there is a change of government, the new Labour government would also deliver Northern Powerhouse Rail in full. You know, so now I accept that we've had commitments previously and we've ultimately been disappointed, but it seems to me there's absolute unanimity at the present time. We have a government which is committed to growth. Now, I know the current budget or mini budget has been somewhat controversial. It's a bit like a curate's egg, isn't it? You know, some parts are good, some parts aren't so good. Um, and I'm not going to make a comment about things that I don't understand in terms of, you know, the pressures on international markets on interest rates. What I do understand, though, is that to unlock the huge economic potential of the North, 
requires the full delivery of Northern Powerhouse Rail. And we don't have to say Northern Powerhouse Rail and the little bit that goes off to Hull or the little bit that goes off to the northeast of England. We worked very hard over many years doing um, analysis and cost-benefit analysis and the costings. And we put forward proposals which we agreed will deliver huge economic growth for our people and across the whole of the north of England. I'm delighted. You know, the, 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 the Prime Minister has committed to it. The government has committed to it. And if there's a change of government, they'll commit to it. We need to stop messing about and being unconfident. We need to be down to the Department of Transport, kicking the door in and demanding that it gets started now. Uh, thank you, uh, Martin. And can I say it's great to see you back? And um, uh, but, uh, I don't think it was a budget. I think they tell me it's a fiscal event. Um, but um, whatever that means, uh, Charlie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so obviously, welcome all the comments of everyone who's absolutely welcoming the announcement on Northern Powerhouse Rail. I've, this is one of the most positive conversations we've ever had uh, in, in, in the year and a half in which I've been attending these meetings. And I think that it is very important that we now double down, that we make sure that we're a positive and proactive partner in this process. We get it delivered, as Martin said, as quickly as we possibly can, so we can really reap the benefits for our residents that we serve. However, the report that we're talking about today is with regards to the Transport Select Committee report. And in their recommendations, I'd just like to pick out the most important one for the residents of Lancashire, which is about the Goldbourne link or the alternatives. It says that the government should set out alternative plans which to Goldbourne link which will add similar capacity as a minimum by March 2023. And I would just like to really reiterate a point that I've made before, which is that in order for Lancashire and further up into the north to benefit from HS2 fully, we require at least either the Goldbourne link or an alternative solution that means that we can reap those rewards. Can we get some clarity today from the DFT about how that process has gone? How are you getting on with appraising alternatives or appraising the Goldbourne link again? Um, is the March 2023 deadline that has been set out going to happen? And, uh, and if so, I think it needs to come back to this organisation and this meeting as quickly as possible so we can see what the options are and we can have our firm belief about what it is that we, what we need. Otherwise, HS2 is not going to benefit the residents of, of Lancashire. We need it to stop at Preston, we need it to stop at Lancaster, and we need it to go further into our friends in Cumbria. So I'm very much interested to hear what the DFT have to say about Goldbourne Link and alternatives today. Asmir, did you, did you want to come in? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I guess I wanted to uh, obviously s express my support for it for, as a um, representative of the Leeds City Region, uh, LEP, but also, as a private sector um, representative, um, I think it's important to note that when we look at the cities that we're competing with around the world, and you know, uh, Mayor Brabin is in Mumbai at the moment, and I happen to have an office in Mumbai, we have a city there of 12 million people. In terms of recruitment and in terms of being able to get capacity to skills and capacity to resources, that block is pretty phenomenal in terms of a single entity and being perceived <coughs> as a single entity. And I think that our real goal here is really sort of creating a solid, consolidated entity that the private sector recognises as a, as a solid entity. And as we have those conversations internationally, and, and you know, the issues around recruitment are really acute at the moment, I think that it's a really powerful angle that is worth also uh, stressing as one of the big benefits. Okay, thank you. Um, Nick, I don't know if you want to wind up in a, in a few moments. I, I was just wondering, Mayor Burnham in first and uh, Peter as well, but uh, Andy first. I think there was Keith as well, uh, Chair. So, yeah.
Yeah, it's on. Yeah, thanks, Andy, uh, and welcome. Uh, nice to see you again. Um, can I just, I mean, you'd think Charlie and I had rehearsed this, and of course we have. Um, but um, the Colborne link, uh, and I don't know now whether the, the new Prime Minister means that we're going to include this in and deliver it as we've asked for it to be delivered, uh, and I hope it is, and I will fully support that. But it's disgraceful to, d to, um, to knock these things out and, and to say we ain't going to do it uh, and have no alternatives or discuss any alternatives. And can I just say, I have sat in meetings, both on teams and in personal meetings, with junior ministers who have came to us from the north and said, don't worry, we're going to come up the north. And it doesn't happen. So, you know, we, we have to be stick to our guns here. This is what we, we, we spent a long time pulling all of this together. Uh, and as Charlie says, if we don't get it up the north, uh, coming up through Lancashire, coming up through Cumbria, and up to our colleagues in Scotland, then that's a huge um, disservice we're doing to the public that we represent, and to the communities, and to the industry, the potential will grow along that line. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Andy? Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to come in, obviously, to, to <clears throat> support what um, what colleagues are saying and to pick up on what Charlie was saying. It, the commitment from the Prime Minister is very welcome. Uh, it was um, the thing, obviously, that stood out to me in the uh, in the leadership election. It is something that I think unites the North with the new administration. <clears throat> so let's let's just be clear about that. That that's good, isn't it? And, we, we weren't able to support the IRP as it, as it stands. What, what I would say then is, wh where do we go from here? I think the effect of the IRP kind of took a lot, away a lot of energy from us and it kind of demoralised us a bit, to say the least. And I think we've kind of almost recapture a bit of the ambition and the, and the passion about it and, and set out again as TFN what this would do beyond better, a better railway, you know, what would this do to our places, what would it do to Bradford if you took uh, full Northern Powerhouse Rail via Bradford? And I, and I think that's the sort of gr the growth story, if I could put it that way, Chair, around full Northern Powerhouse Rail is, is what we should be then um, kind of building and linking it to sort of new government priorities, investment zones. you know. Do you see the point that I'm, I'm making? I think we need to kind of refresh the case <clears throat> from a broader perspective, not just a transport perspective, and then be ready to present it to the government. And what, 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 um, what, what I think might make sense is we have offered to host the Convention of the North next year. For those who don't know, uh, it will be on the 25th of January at Manchester Central. I mean, that obviously is the time to kind of go exactly what Martin was saying, you know, go back to the sort of, you know, the, the, the big vision for what it was, serving the North East and Hull and everywhere, Sheffield, and um, <clears throat> tell the growth story uh, around it as, as well. So I, I think that's what we, what we should be thinking of rather than, you know, just, just hoping that, you know, the government are moving in the right direction. I think it's for us to sort of say this is the... The, the right plan and, and this is what everything achieves for growth and as I understand it the select committee report it's a while since I read it to be honest but the select committee report picked up something that I think TFN said to the committee in evidence I certainly did in evidence which was there was never a leveling up assessment done of the IRP I mean that was the killer to be honest with you that I think sunk it more than anything in that you know how could there not be a leveling up assessment there was a a connectivity assessment and our plan were won out substantially on a connect, from a connectivity point of view but the fact that they didn't even do a leveling up assessment of our preferred route versus what they came up with for me says that it, uh, it, it, it wasn't good enough so I don't know if the government has had any contact with TFN chair over this the Prime Minister's commitment it, it, I'm sure maybe there's early stages of that contact I think at this stage, the key message to get over to the government is they really could not bring something back without a levelling up assessment. That just feels to me to be not tenable to present a plan that again lacks a levelling up uh, assessment. 
So I think that is a good position for us to be in now, but then develop the growth story, the, the ambition, and then get it ready to present to the, um, a refreshed version of it to the Convention of the North in January. A last point, if I may, just on Goldbourne Link and um, West Coast Mainland, again in support. It, it's not, ex you know, I, uh, for, as a constituency MP, struggled with, I live in Goldbourne, I, I struggled obviously, with, uh, you remember, I think I used to lobby <laughs> your good self. There was a depot originally linked to it, which, which was helpfully relocated. Um, but I stood by the Goldbourne Link, even though it was politically detrimental to do so because there has to be connectivity to the West Coast Main Line, I think as Charlie is saying, if you are to unlock the benefit of the investment that's going into HS2. If there is no connection to the West Coast Main Line, the case for it really diminishes dramatically, uh, I would say. So the kind of removal of the Goldborn link, I think it was on the day that there was a confidence vote, I think, so it kind of implies that politics was more at play than evidence. If there is to be a nor more northerly connection that's doable, well, we need to see it, don't we? We need to kind of understand what that is. It's bad, it could be bad news for Wigan for, from our point of view. If it's higher up the Wigan, because then uh, we would lose some of the benefit that was in the Goldborn Link plan. However, we all have to give and take. If there's a plan that takes it Preston Way, south of Preston, I think they have to put that plan on the table. Um, and it has to be done fairly soon because the bill's in Parliament and the, and, you know, the, the, the debate around these things is, is in theory moving ahead and you know, we haven't got clarity. So I just would fully support there has to be a connection to the West Coast Main Line. It has to bring wider benefit to the sort of Wigan and above, if I could put it that way. Uh, but we just need to see the plan, otherwise you know, we're in danger of really losing clarity here on what, what HS2 is meant to achieve. Thanks for that, Andy. Um, Sorry, Peter, did you? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I support everything that's been said by everyone that's spoken on this issue. Um, I just wanted to just give you a, a quick South Yorkshire perspective on things. Um, you'll have, members will have heard the news that Doncaster Sheffield Airport is to close, and that's thrown into even sharper focus the importance of Northern Powerhouse Rail for our international co connectivity. We're losing our international gateway. So um, it's, it's yet another reason why we are very, very uh, keen that uh, TFM progresses. Uh, and I was really reassured to hear what Tim said uh, about delivery of Northern Powerhouse Rail in full. Just a quick second point whilst DFT are here today, and that is the timetable in terms of reference for the lead study. We're 10 months into the IRP. Uh, we still don't know uh, when this is going to be announced. And of course, our communities are sat there with a safeguarded HS2 route. We can't remove the bike. We can't move on with life until we know where we're going. So it would be helpful to get some further comments on when that is going to happen. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks uh, for that, Peter. Uh, and Andy, can I just say, I think you've uh, set us quite an interesting timetable for the Convention of the North uh, January meeting. We have obviously got another board meeting on the 14th of uh, December, so that will actually tie in time-wise for the 25th of January as well. Uh, Nick, do you want to uh, sort of give us a bit of a, a sort of update on, on various things? And um, just, just for my own clarity as well, you, you might just, um, I, I, I haven't quite caught out yet with who is actually the minister now that's going to be dealing with HS2 as, um, as, as Andrew has obviously uh, moved on. Um, it, so you can perhaps help us on that as well, please. Thanks. Well, I was on a minute ago. I'll, uh, thanks, Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to make a, a few remarks. I'll perhaps try and draw a few threads out of that discussion, um, as well as um, answering sort of some of the specific questions um, as we go. I think just to start on the kind of analysis, because that is the piece that is most directly uh, kind of being done with TFN colleagues at the moment. Um, on the back of the integrated rail plan, we knew that the business case for Northern Powerhouse Rail needed refreshing. It would anyway have been a requirement of the Green Book that we looked at alternatives 
in representing that business case. And therefore, I think from our perspective, actually the right uh, work has been commissioned from TFN, uh, from Tim and the TAME team, um, and that we expect that to be available around the end of the year. Um, and I think that's probably the first thing to say in terms of how we're looking at the sort of decisions here. I think the second thing uh, would be one of the other things the Prime Minister said during the uh, leadership campaign was a clear desire to engage more closely with people in this room and beyond in terms of members of parliament. So I think you will find there is an open door there um, and I think you will find there is a genuine desire um, on the part of ministers to do that. Um, and that I would anticipate happening over the, a similar sort of time frame um, as well. The, um, in terms of the minister question, um, Patrick, it's Kevin Foster, who is the Minister of State, who will be dealing with both uh, rail and uh, HS2, um, and indeed sort of Northern Powerhouse Rail within that. I think there's one other thing that Tim said in his way of opening remarks that's perhaps just worth coming back to. There's a, as, a, as others have said, there's a huge programme of work here. Um, actually, the full NPR hangs off opening HS2 into Manchester. You know, the timescales for that, the IRP had a range around 2040. You know, that's the scale of the endeavour that we are collectively engaged on here. And one of the things that I think Tim said was, actually having got clarity, we need to come back to what can be done sooner and what are the benefits and improvements that people in the north are going to see over the next 10 years and in advance of that. And I think that is quite an important point uh, that you, know, you will want to consider, um, and I'm sure that ministers will as well. If I come on to some of the sort of more specific um, uh, questions, um, on Goldbourne, we are looking at the alternatives. That work is being done by a combination of Network Rail and High Speed 2 Limited. I can't give you a definitive answer on timing, but I will take that away as a question. I think one thing I would say, though, um, is it's, not, it's always the case that um, HS2 was planned to open to crew, Phase 2A. In fact, it was Lord McLaughlin's uh, doing, I seem to remember, in another guise, uh, before Goldbourne and the 2B line to Manchester. And there is actually a significant set of service benefits to Lancashire um, at that point. Yes, there are more when you get to Goldbourne, but I, don't, I just don't want, wouldn't want to leave the impression that it's nothing uh, until you get there. There are actually things that flow. And if, you know, if that's not clear, then I think we would be happy to set some of that out um, in terms of what is anticipated uh, when. Um, on the Leeds uh, terms of reference, I absolutely understand kind of the um, sense that Peter was uh, relaying, um, and we do hope to get those uh, published soon, but please sort of bear with me uh, for sort of obvious reasons with um, events, um, as they say. I hope that's given a, a sense of um, the overall position. Um, it remains the case, as we have discussed with Martin, that the benefits of uh, the crew Northern Connection are within the, high, the Northern Powerhouse Rail business case, even though we anticipate it being delivered as part of Phase 2B. Um, and that's why you see the, the change in the train service in the NPR proposals to make sure that the benefits go in the right place. OK, Nick, uh, thank you very much for that. I mean, you certainly, uh, you know, you can now see, without any doubt, the, uh, the infrastructure progress that is being made as far as building up to Birmingham. And uh, I look forward to... Uh, the uh, crew section being uh, completed in its parliamentary stages very soon and the carry on from there on. Uh, right, I think that sort of. Uh, so it's just a recommendation. Um, uh, there, we've got two recommendations there, uh, and is everybody content with those two recommendations set out at paragraph two? Okay, fine, thank you very much indeed. Right, that brings us now on to a, an, another issue which is uh, going to take a, a little bit of time, uh, which is a Transpennine upgrade. And uh, Martin, uh, you're going to introduce this, and then Neil's going to take us through uh, some of the changes. 
thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to briefly introduce Neil because I think in that earlier conversation, a lot of the emphasis is about getting things done and starting to see things on the ground. And I think what's clear is that TransPennine Upgrade is now getting into that stage. So I think um, given the, the work that this board has done in the past to make the case for that investment, I think we should be welcoming what's being done. I think we should see it as an opportunity in which to build. And I think, Neil, um, you're going to give us an update around that and also uh, I think you're wanting to reach out to this board to see how we can work to support you in delivery. Neil, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Martin, and thank you, Chair. Uh, and thank you to all members for giving us the opportunity to talk about the Transpennine Upgrade Programme. Um, there are some slides, I think, if you can put the slides up, please. Um, we've just got some, some visuals here that will help uh, explain where we, are, where we are with the Transpennine Route Upgrade. Um, and I'll start off with the journey that we've been on. Um, I think most members will understand it's been on quite a long journey to uh, full communication and authorization. We started off uh, as a partial electrification program, then a full electrification program with some substantial performance upgrades. And then where we are now, which is the, uh, the, the full version of Transparent Route Upgrade, which, which has all of what we would call the core benefits to upgrade the route uh, and, and deliver the benefits, which we'll talk about in a minute. But also, in line with that, we were asked by the Department of Transport to include any Northern Powers Rail projects that would be part of this railway. The, the reason for that is so that we don't come back uh, subsequently and, and dig up the railway for a second time and cause uh, both more cost and disruption. So um, we believe we've now got a stable scope. Obviously, it was announced as part of the integrated rail plan and then, and then specifically subsequently announced uh, and then included as part of an NAO report, which, which we have a summary in these slides, which we'll distribute uh, after the session. So what benefits does TransPennine route upgrade bring? So firstly, more trains and more seats, so up to six uh, fast services and two stopping services, which is an additional two paths. Uh, faster journeys, so uh, journeys between York and Manchester of between 63 and 66 minutes, which is about a 10 minute improvement. And a more reliable journey is not on the slide there, but we're, we're aiming for 90% uh, of all trains to, to arrive on time um, and what is currently a, a, a challenging route with regards to reliability. Um, better stations, we'll talk a little bit around the station programme, and that's one of the key aspects that we aim for customers to see early in this program as we invest in stations and create the environment, um, a much better environment for, for, for getting to and from the train. Um, and then greener travel, as I said, is a, a full electrification program, um, uh, but we're also looking at development items which will allow intermodal freight across the Pennines, uh, taking a substantial number of lorries off the road, um, and then um, our route to net zero is one of the key aspects of this program, and, and we have a, a, a carbon calculation tool and some carbon targets that we use to measure our performance against that. So apologies for people who already know this, but I'll just go back to what is the TransPennine route upgrade. So it's a, it's a full upgrade of, of the route between Manchester, Victoria and York uh, via Huddersfield. Um, but also it includes a, a, a number of diversion routes which you'll see on, on the map there. Um, we'll talk a little bit later, but the diversion routes are really important to this program. One of the key aspects of the studies we did at the start of this was how do you upgrade uh, a, an operational railway? And the diversion routes were one of the key elements to keep people on the trains and allow, uh, allow passengers to get where they need to without, without having to either change onto buses or, or multiple trains. So we're on the ground at the moment on those diversionary routes, um, and we're also on the ground at the Manchester section, the York section, and anybody has been on the train here on the East Coast mainline or, or from Manchester, Victoria, will see in the works that are significantly underway. I won't go through these in detail, but TLU numbers is, is substantially more than, than purely a, a, an electrification upgrade. It's a, it's, a, it's a very substantial upgrade to the whole railway with a particular focus uh, in and around the Huddersfield area. If you look at the, our biggest project between Huddersfield and Ravensthorpe, where we take the railway from two tracks to four tracks, now that's to allow the, uh, slow, the fast trains to overtake the slow trains um, and give far faster journeys and, and, and more reliability so, so trains don't get slowed down and stopped. Um, 
really significant piece of work. I think one of the headlines here, which we don't have, the, have on the slide, is we have about an average of 2,000 or so people working on the programme at the moment. That's going to raise to between 3,500 and 4,000 people when we're at peak, providing a really substantial uh, social value impact of this programme. And when we look at the social value impact, and, and this is a really important part of the programme, it's not just a, a railway infrastructure programme, how we employ local people, um, do STEM engagements, develop the next generation. I had the pleasure of, of um, inviting in our first group of specifically two of your graduates two weeks ago, and it's a, a hugely positive programme around how we generate the next generation and generate prosperity for the communities we work in. It's also hugely important because at the the uh, number of people we need to employ and the challenges around around actually getting the right number of people to deliver the job it, it is substantial. So we are very focused on training and development, um, young people engagement, and then focusing on how we can finish this programme with with a significant impact in the communities that we've been working in. And when we talk about that, sustainability and climate change is also a, a key element of this programme. Obviously, the, the electrification part of that helps our route to net zero. But our targets within the uh, construction supply chain to reduce the amount of embedded carbon and the amount of carbon we use in construction is also a key element. And we have, we have targets in our supply chain, and we work very closely with them on innovation to do that. Uh, biodiversity net gain is also a key target. We, uh, we have, a, we have a, a real important target, particularly where we're doing the major infrastructure works and we're taking some of the land in and around uh, our, our works to make sure that we return the land in a better state with a better biodiversity as we go along. Programme timeline. Um, so when you look at this, the core programme which delivers the main timetable and performance benefits I talked to you about completes in the early 2030s and then between the mid 2030s and 2040s we uh, deliver the, the final elements of the, the Northern Powerhouse Rail projects. Now they are in development uh, and integration at the moment we're expecting to improve on some of those time scales as we further integrate them into programme and, and, and get improved benefits and efficiencies. Um, but we're very, very conscious that we have to deliver um, benefits to customers and communities well before that. So. We've got a sequence of key outputs, um, around seven at the moment on plan, where as we deliver, deliver and develop parts of this programme, we'll um, deliver those benefits to both the, the train, transportation and the communities. Um, so the first stage of that is the diversionary routes, upgrade to diversionary, diversionary routes, which we're spending over £100 million on uh, a number of routes outside of the core corridor to both uh, increase their resilience but also um, give a lasting legacy benefit. Um, and then our first key output that, that passengers will see will be electrification from Manchester to Staley Bridge in 2024, um, which will be the, the first uh, performance improvement that we'll see uh, on this programme. Um, so all this work that we've got, this can't be done without some level of impact to the operational railway. We have to close the railway to, to work on it. And we've put a huge amount of effort into uh, keeping passengers moving, as I talked about on uh, earlier in diversion routes. We use um, key performance indicators where we engage with passengers and ask them what they want. And we've spent a lot of time ensuring that we understand what's the best way to keep people moving, be it on buses or on, on diversionary routes. We've also employed uh, more customer service um, individuals to make sure that we, we can manage the flow of this. And as part of our uh, interaction with um, TFN, TFN chair a stakeholder forum for us where we can get uh, very clear feedback on what is the best way to enact the works to have the least impact on communities and make sure people can get to where they need to get to while we're, while we're undertaking works. And I think it's worth saying we've done a lot already. Um, prior to the release of the integrated rail plan, we were a little bit limited on what we could say around the size and scale of the programme. But, but here's where we at Manchester Victoria and, and, and the miles platting curve um, in summer of last year. And that was our first really big intervention. Uh, and it, it went extremely well. And it went extremely well um, by and part to the collaboration between 
um, Manchester Authority, um, the communities we work in, and, and, and the wider rail and transport network. And we talk about net promoter score. Interesting enough, the net promoter score of people transporting during this period actually went up. So we did a good job of that, and we need to maintain doing a, a good job of keeping people mo moving. And, and there we are, again, some more Manchester Victoria. Um, that's platform zero at Leeds. Um, and there we are putting new track and all the way up on the east and the York side. So a huge amount already ongoing. Uh, like I said, we've got about 2,000 people already working on the program, uh, and, and the profile of the program will, will be raising uh, substantially over the next uh, year or so. And that's, um, well, that's a, not a great picture of me, but I can only apologise for that. But that is, that's a, 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 a picture of a um, Transport and Works Act order uh, between Huddersfield uh, and Ravensthorpe. The, the importance of this can't be understated, and there was a huge amount of support uh, from, from Kirkley's Council to achieve this. Um, this is one of the largest uh, orders um, we Network Rail have ever achieved, um, and it allows us to start the works on that really significant core section where we go to four, four tracks. So, um, massive thank you to everybody involved in that and the support from the, the, the Council to achieve that successfully. And future key interventions, so on the left we've got a remodelling of, of Huddersfield uh, Station, um, which will both remodels the station and, and uh, renovates and uh, adds a new canopy. And then what we'll see there on, on the centre is uh, the 350 metre long viaduct that we're building uh, over the river to Dewsbury. And then on the right hand side, uh, Church Fenton, uh, New York. Um, and these interventions provide significant performance increases and um, will we'll create a much more modern, much more reliable railway. I'm just going to hand over to John Reid, who's our Director of uh, Integrations, just going to tell us a little bit about some of the development topics that we're working both in terms of stations and freight. Thank you, John. Thanks, Neil. So Neil's talked about our core plans, but we are still very much developing this program further to make sure it works for passengers and uh, freight customers. Uh, and I'll just draw your attention to a few, please. So firstly, on stations, we're developing a range of proposals for station improvements along the route, which would include step-free access, um, extending the platforms for longer trains in the future, and also improving facilities on station furnitures to create a more, uh, a more welcoming and supportive environment for passengers. Um, on freight, um, TIU has traditionally been very passenger focused, but thanks to DFT funding, um, we're now going to be adapting part of this route to take the large box containers um, on the back of trains that uh, shipping companies use, which will open up the freight route, uh, the route to far more freight markets. Um, we're also developing plans with our colleagues in the department to run freight uh, under electric rather than diesel traction, and indeed to run a further 15 additional trains on the route each day. And we're putting those proposals to the department by the end of this year. Finally, something we're working very closely with local authorities on, uh, along the route uh, is our what we call the first and last mile route. And actually, I was very interested to hear your connected mobility discussion earlier because we're very keen to, to be part of that. Um, and we recognize that although we've spent a long time talking about the train service here, this is here to serve people and to connect people to places and opportunities. Um, so we're working very closely with the local authorities to look at how we align our planning and investment plans such that when the upgrade is finished, the train is the easy and accessible choice for people locally. Um, I'll, I'll move on to the next one, thanks. Um, look, you, you probably can't see the detail on this, but we are very conscious that the Transpennine route upgrade is one of very many things happening in the region. Um, and we know it needs to be complementary to what's going on elsewhere. Um, I won't go into the detail, but this shows a range of projects that are either in development, design, or delivery around the area, the region at the moment that we're working very closely with. And of course, we're very pleased to be in there as the first phase of NPR. Um, I'll hand back to Neil to conclude. So just to conclude, uh, um, I, th I thank the Chair and, and the members for their support with us. Um, we can't do this alone. It's a huge intervention. And the things we need help with is how do we make the railway the heart of the communities and how do we get feedback to do that? Obviously our focus is upgrade of the railway, but as John said, the last mile and how we um, help really energise some of the development programmes of communities is really important. We really welcome the advocacy to help both support and explain this programme um, and again the feedback of how best to do that we, we would welcome. And then there are a number of, of planning and legal consents which we work through um, 
over the next coming years and the support in, in, in developing those and delivering those is of great help. So thank you for your time and I would welcome feedback and questions. Okay, uh, thank you, Neil. Um, oh, the one thing that we would like to see happen is for us to be reinstated um, on the uh, programme board, as opposed, but I know that's a Department of Transport matter, but one of the things in the report is uh, it's asking for the board to endorse that, so I'll ask for that at the end, uh, and we'll make that request when we meet the new Secretary of State. Um, it, it, just on these closures, I, I think uh, one of the experiences I've seen from closures is, you know, giving adequate knowledge of it and showing people exactly why it's happening. There is an understanding, uh, and it does mean that some of the work, which would have taken a lot longer if you hadn't had the closures, can be done a lot quicker. And I think getting that message across is uh, one of the key things as far as uh, engaging with the public and letting them know what's actually happening and why the closures are taking place. Um, Martin, I think, wants to just. It's fine. Okay. Uh, can I, uh, uh, Liam, you want to come in, and then anybody else who wants to come in? I mean, this is a very encouraging uh, development, but as you can see from these sort of things, just the time it takes to get these planning matters uh, through and to actually carry them out is uh, vitally important. Uh, Liam. Yeah, thanks very much and, and completely agree uh, with the Chair in the sense that this is very encouraging, it's significant investment and that's very, very welcome. There are, there are two key points that I wanted to get clarity on really. One, particularly around the kind of additional freight capacity, that's very, very welcome uh, news to hear. Can we get a bit more detail around that and is that going to actually be W12 gauge clearance? It, it is brilliant because the thing I'm very, very conscious of is that the Port of Liverpool, not just as the main deep water port for the north of England, but actually the whole of the British mainland on the west coast, um, actually deals predominantly in the largest containers. So earlier conversations we've had about lower floor wagons that can only take smaller containers just wouldn't work for the freight mix that, that comes into Liverpool. So if that is W12 gauge clearance, that, that's exceptional. And we really need to celebrate that as a huge win for TFN's lobbying, actually, because that's a real big step in the right direction. Second uh, point is uh, around the kind of communications because we're in what I call omelette territory in the sense that if we're going to enjoy the meal, we're going to have to break some eggs to, to do it. And it's great that you've put a lot of work into uh, the approach of making sure that there are diversionary routes and the ability to, to move people and goods around the north in a seamless way at a time that, let's be honest, is going to be disruptive. But I think probably the most important additional um, aspect of that as well is how we communicate that, not just to the travelling public, but to the whole of the UK public, because what's really, really important is that, yes, the significant work here that is going to be disruptive if you need to, to move around the north or through the north is going to take you a bit longer than would have been the case uh, previously and certainly will be the case once all the work is, is done. But how are we making sure we're very sort of prominently pressing the message that even throughout this disruption, the north is going to remain open for business because we don't want a situation that people avoid travelling round or avoid coming to and from the north during this period of time. We want to make sure we get the kind of right economic benefit throughout the work. Thanks, Liam. That's a very good point. Uh, Peter and then uh, Charlie. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's uh, leading on from the very point that you made about communications and also that Liam has just made, and it's the ripple effect that these diversionary routes, some of them have capacity challenges of their own, and if there are going to be trade-offs in terms of existing services having to be moved, the communication needs to be across the north. We've got the Hope Valley Line, for example, which suffers capacity challenges, both for passenger and freight, despite the upgrade that's happening. So we, we, we just need to be kept in the loop, um, as, uh, literally, <laughs> hopefully not literally, um, whilst all this is happening. Um, so maybe that communication just needs to be region-wide, so we can communicate to our travelling public too, if there could be any disruption to them. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I fully support everything that's been that's been said today. I really welcome the, the the update that we've been given today. And in terms of substance of the report, I'm, I just just go ahead with it. You're doing a great job, and keep going. Um, I wanted to raise a really really tiny point, um, and I'm probably the one person in the country who will actually have picked up on it. Um, but I do think words matter, and this is actually an internal transport for the North point, which is in the previous agenda item. Uh, we welcomed a report, the Transport Select Committee report, which said that the government was wrong. And then in agenda item five, we note the fact that we've got treble investment in the TRU. So we welcome something bad and we only note something that's good. And I just think if we really want to be a credible and positive partner to the government, to the, the, the Department for Transport, I think words do matter and I think we should in writing welcome the investment today so i would be very grateful with my colleague's permission that we change that word sorry to be very councillory for a second but it, i think it matters words matter Th thanks for that charlie i think that is a, f a point that is uh, well made um the, the, the um so, sorry and and sorry mayor Bear. Andy. Uh, th thank you chair uh, i'm happy to accept the proposed amendments because I think we all welcome uh, what we've heard uh, this morning so thank you it's clarity and it's good to see uh, that clear uh, clear plan two um, two points if I could just just briefly chair the first does relate back to our earlier discussion because reference was made to NPR and NPR compatibility so the question in my mind as I was, as I was listening to you is but if NPR is changing what does that mean around Huddersfield, Marsden, and you know, is that not causing a com could that not cause a complication here that could delay things or confuse things? And so I'd, I'd just be grateful if you could explain a bit more because I'm not sure how you could have clarity on what NPR means for T uh, TRU at this moment in time. And I'd just be grateful if you could say a little more. I, I guess the only slight disappointment I had looking at, at, um, at the chart was the timeline and um, full benefit realizations it still feels a long way away and I just wondered if you could tell us something about is everything possible being done to bring that further forward you know I take your points about you know possessions and blockades and, and all of the you know, but believe it or not we might even be prepared to do more if that's the issue you know maybe tell us about that and see what we're prepared to take you know i just think bringing f realizing the benefits sooner is something that you know if there is a conversation to be had about that well i'd certainly be prepared to have that conversation because it does feel still fairly distant uh, if i'm no if i was just to to give you a sort of one reaction to what what i saw but overall uh, to echo charlie and others you know that's re really encouraging and, and what liam said I, I think there is a growing sort of view uh, coming in the industry to a degree that blockades may be something which is moving a bit more up the agenda actually uh, as far as a, a speedier delivery is concerned but it, it, they, they do take a lot of planning um, I, I think that's a valid point and I think it's it's also the way in which the use of the railways are, are changing and uh, there's much more weekend usage uh, of the railways and perhaps there was uh, t 10 years ago and it's becoming much more of a live issue that that is being looked at and uh, I think that's a helpful uh, suggestion Andy um, to take on board uh, I think Nick did you did you indicate you wanted to come in yeah I can help a bit and um, Neil and, and John may wish to add just on um, the question from uh, Mayor Burnham um, I think if you look at the scope that has been asked of TRU I would say it comes in broadly three buckets uh, one is uh, Marsden to Huddersfield, um, and actually much of that has wider benefits, not least for some of the freight outputs that uh, Liam was talking about uh, earlier. Uh, the second is Leeds to York, where the original NPR plans assumed that the HS2 Church Fenton link had been built, um, and I suspect you might all want to look at keeping that within TRU as an alternative. Um, and the third uh, is the section between um, Ravensthorpe um, and Leeds. Um, that one is at the 
is the least far forward, let me put it that way, in terms of development and design. But Neil, feel free to add on. Uh, thank, thanks, Arthur. Uh, do you want to just uh, sort of comment on, on what's been said and uh, give us your views? Yes, so I just index through some of the comments. To clarify, we, we have a requirement to um, design and develop a scheme for W12 gauge, so just to confirm on that, that would require uh, some, some significant upgrade to two of the largest tunnels on the route. Um, but I think that through feedback from freight, that's obviously been a huge priority. And, and one of the really important ways of running this program is, is we con constantly take feedback of how the environment changes, because over the life of a program, you're unlikely to get it absolutely perfect at the, at the start. Um, on the communication side, um, there's two elements to communication. The first one is a, is a significant PR campaign we're running at the moment, though you may have seen TRU uh, on the television or on in, in the newspapers. The reason we're doing that is to, to gain engagement and advocacy for the programme so that the general public understand uh, the level of commitment and the size and scale of, on, and why we're doing what we're doing. The second is very specific about how people actually transport. We'll start communication around, around disruption between two, two and three months before it happens. Uh, and we'll make sure it's very clear how we do that and then how we plan that disruption actually when we're doing it, having the customer services people on the ground to make sure people can get to where they get to clearly is a very important part of this. Now we partner with uh, TP in Northern uh, as our partners on this programme to make sure we can we can manage that in the best way possible. And if we don't get 100% right, we, we improve on, on what we do every single time. Um, um, I think, thank you for the, the feedback on MPI. I won't pick that up specifically. On the timeline, um, we're very conscious of the amount of time this programme takes. Um, with our current principles around access, they're the durations we have, but we're working very closely with train operating colleagues and we welcome a, a, a conversation understanding of how we can actually maybe accelerate the programme through a, a more a different brocade type strategy um, when we have maturity and, and ready to go because the, the passenger flows that we're seeing when we work with TP in Northern are potentially quite different now from what we may have had uh, pre-COVID and we may have some different strategies that could accelerate this programme. Thank you. Can I respond quickly to say, I mean, it, this, it would make this gathering meaningful if perhaps you could come back at the right moment with options for acceleration. Because obviously the pain is felt by us and the, the collaboration will be needed from the councils and business organisations represented in this room. But if we had the chance to do that, I think we would be prepared to, you know, to, to, to do that rather than it just be sort of on a timeline. And, you know, so I, I would certainly be interested in that if that's something that you felt worth exploring. But I, I'm sorry to be, I, I don't think I've got clarity on the MPR point. You know, Clearly, you're working within the integrated rail plan when you talk about up there. So could you just explain again for me how you've got clarity about that, given that MPR is up in the air at the moment? Uh, can I just bring Nick in first before before I bring uh, Neil back? And uh, Tim, I don't know if you wanted to uh, perhaps just uh, give us a bit of a network rail point of view, but uh, Nick. So, so what I was just trying to say, and perhaps didn't get over clearly, some of the scope that's been asked in an MPR context is arguably the right thing to do anyway, particularly for some of the freight outputs. Some of it um, is, I think, better delivered, aligned with TRU, than assuming that the HS2 eastern leg gets built in full. And the, the bit that is variable is actually at the back end of the queue in terms of design, and therefore is the easiest to make subsequent changes to. So, I think I understand. <laughs> Apologies if I'm being daft here, but if MPR is a new line via Bradford, let's, okay, I know you might say that's a big if, but it is. That's surely substantially different to the working assumption from the IRP, isn't it? It is. I'm about the peace between Marsden and Huddersfield anyway for the freight outputs you would want to keep the east of Leeds outputs anyway, um, and the swing items are those that are the back of the queue in terms of design. Thank you. Okay. 
Yes, I, mean, I think, first, a great presentation, and, and I think that absolutely drives to the heart of what we're trying to do in Never Round, which is to position ourselves as delivering for passengers and for freight users. And that's what we're here for, do, to do with yourselves as the community. Um, I think the, some points that you bring up, uh, about blockades and possession strategy particularly, is absolutely fundamental. And that's why it's so good to see the focus and the money, the 100 million that's been spent on the diversionary routes. Because it is actually that that enables that blockade strategy to be credible, because obviously we still want to look after passengers during that time of construction. So I think this is you know, ticking all the right boxes. I absolutely think it needs to press on and focus on the delivery. Neil and John need to be given all of our support to get on with it. And I think it's a fair challenge to come back with some, let's say, radical options about how, using that diversionary strategy that's being created, the timescale can be challenged. OK, thank you very much indeed. We've perhaps spent a bit longer on that than we'd uh, originally intended, but I think it, is, it was certainly uh, well, worthwhile. Can I ask for the endorsement of our recommendations? And the I... change of the wording from notes to welcome. And uh, we, we will also change the wording from notes to uh, welcomes. Um, very, very much welcomes. I think a, an initial programme cost of 2.7 billion, going up to 9 billion now, uh, I think. So uh, a very, very substantial investment indeed. OK, uh, is that, does that meet everyone's approval? Thank you very much indeed. Uh, right, um, we've uh, we dealt with the, uh, the next two items on the agenda, which we uh, did earlier on. Can we uh, move on to international connectivity policy now? And uh, Tim, you're going to take us uh, through this. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, this is a really important, significant piece of work, but I am going to introduce it very briefly, um, not least given that the Partnership Board had quite a substantive discussion about all of this in July. Uh, and what we're bringing back today for endorsement by the Board um, is the international connectivity strategy, but taking into account the feedback that we got from you and the really helpful conversation in the summer. So um, <clears throat> I'm, not, I'm not going to introduce it in detail. I'll take the paper as read. Uh, what the policy position is doing is, is really recognising formally um, that the economic, uh, social, and de decarbonisation opportunity um, and the strategic importance of our ports and airports and our international gateways to the, to the, to the, to the whole of the transport network and indeed to growth and prosperity across the north. Um, that's the purpose of it. It also innate means that then, although TFN is not directly responsible for either aviation or indeed um, ports and airports, that we are, through all our work, whether it's around surface access, um, uh, to those gateways by road and rail, and particularly the work on Northern Pass Rail and HS2 we've already touched on, in the work that we're doing around decarbonisation and place making, the inclusive um, uh, transport strategy we discussed earlier, recognising that those places are also really critical employment centres um, for, for very large numbers of people right across the north. That in, that, that, so that in all the work that TFN does, we are fully recognising both the opportunity um, and, and the benefits that come from better connecting our ports and airports. And I thought it was just worth saying that from the outset. That is effectively what the policy position does. We will take it and build it into the strategic transport plan um, that we're developing, and we'll bring that back to the board in December. Um, I did want to touch very briefly on the work that we've done alongside the policy position on aviation emissions, which came out the work on the decarbonisation strategy. And <clears throat> where, with the help of um, uh, both officers across the north, for which, as ever, thank you very much, uh, stakeholders, including the, um, the airports and ports themselves uh, and the environmental organisations, but also expert support from uh, the Institute of Transport Studies and others, looked carefully at what are the opportunities around uh, reducing aviation emissions, which really is a national issue, but where in the discussion with the Partnership Board, and it's set out in section six of the report, we put a number of options for, for TFN taking a strengthened uh, position on, on aviation emissions, uh, and where the, the view of the Partnership Board was that we should be going further and faster uh, than the national position set out in Jet Zero by the government over the summer. And now, in <coughs> it's worth saying that in pushing for advocating for that stronger position, what we are doing is linking that very clearly to 
the need to not only to, to make better use of the untapped potential in northern airports, but, but to align that again to the work that we will do around improving surface access, um, uh, particularly for, for communities, different communities right across the north. Uh, and I think, I think with a particular focus on some of the east-west connectivity issues that, that Peter alluded to earlier, um, as well as to sort of strengthen and, and to work collaboratively as we are doing on uh, to promote uh, the opportunity really of decarbonisation and uh, particularly from an innovation point of view that the, the, the way in which the North is at the forefront of efforts to decarbonise the industry. So uh, there is lots of um, positive opportunity here I think for, for North um, and for TFN support. Um, uh, as I said, we've been working closely with the um, uh, environmental organisations. They have written to us um, prior to the board, um, uh, I think broadly welcoming um, the work that's been done, the way in which we've done it, uh, for which we're really grateful. Uh, I think they have challenged us on whether going further and faster than the national position is credible, uh, and, and in particular, um, uh, whether um, demand management is a viable thing for TFN to be advocating. I think that's a really important point, that uh, what we're talking about here is um, what is, a, what is as, as we know, a private, a private sector um, influence. We're not talking about regulation here. Um, this is about our ability as the North to, to um, create the conditions through which uh, demand, demand is rebalanced and potentially changed. So, um, um, I'll leave it there, Chair. As I said, this is a, a really important piece of work, but I'm not going to go through it in detail. I think what we're looking for today is just confirmation that the Board are um, happy to now ex um, adopt it as the policy position. Okay. Uh, thanks, Tim. Uh, Mark. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, you, you, you touched, Tim, on something I was going to raise um, specifically. And, I, and I've reflected on, from the last meeting, our position about this option three, faster, further, and trying to manage demand. And I'm just a little bit concerned that that's a, a policy position that we take, um, particularly given the, the sad news from this, this recent time about closure of, of, of a, a regional airport here. And therefore, once that airport is shut, we make a statement uh, that we support the National Moratorium on Runway Development. Would that mean that previous airport capacity that goes out of capacity can't be brought back in, for instance? And I just worry about we perhaps haven't thought through some of those implications. Anybody else want to come in on that? It's, uh, there are, uh, right at the back, sorry. Can't see your name tag, sorry. Yeah. I'm, uh, Richard Halligan, thank you. Yeah, th thanks, Chair. Uh, yeah, a couple of issues. Um, uh, again, a, a, a very forward-thinking docu document. Uh, <clears throat> very notable that uh, the South Humber, uh, the, the, the Grimsby and Immingham Port Complex, uh, is bringing in by far the largest tonnage of, uh, of uh, freight into the UK uh, as we speak today. Uh, and also there are massive developments there in terms of the production of both green hydrogen and blue hydrogen. And yet our transport links to the rest of the country remain uh, somewhat tenuous. Uh, there's, I think, now a growing need to uh, put a third lane into the A180 uh, and also seeing Northern's intention to reduce the, uh, the, 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 the passenger train uh, frequency into North Lincolnshire and indeed North East Lincolnshire is disappointing. Uh, I think a very short term view that uh, really ought to be reviewed going forward. I mean, just on a last interesting note, um, I entirely support the view of zero carbon aviation. Uh, I've had the pleasure of flying a zero carbon aircraft, an electric aircraft, but the duration at 35 minutes is still challenged at this time, although I think we can look forward to great improvements in the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Peter. Got that Charlie, next. Charlie? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And firstly, I'd like to uh, associate my uh, 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 appreciation for the comments made by uh, Mark just then um, with regards to the aviation question and I think it's something that we should definitely consider very seriously and in the, co in the course of this meeting there has been a statement from the Transport Secretary which talks about 
decarbonising the aviation industry. And so I think it is very important that we keep this on our radar and we do what we can to, to support that mission. Uh, I wanted to just uh, ask a question with regards to the table in page 77 where it, link, it, it lists the airports and ports. I'm very proud that we have Blackpool Airport as well in the north, uh, in the north of England and I appreciate that that doesn't feature presumably because of its modest passenger numbers at this time. Um, however, there is also the Hesham Port in Lancashire which has a tonnage of around 4 million tonnes in 2020 and uh, I would just like to make sure that it is, uh, it is um, reflected in this document and in our thinking um, because I think obviously we're very proud of it in Lancashire as, as, as you would be um, and just because it doesn't have that same capacity as some of the bigger ones does not mean that there are not active operations that exist at these port facilities and the same is true for Manchester for Sunderland and I just would like to make sure that those smaller but still important uh, parts of the freight network are recognised. Tim. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you and apologies because I think and your officers have really helpfully already flagged this to us. We think it's just something that slipped through the net but apologies, we'll make sure it's reinserted. Okay, okay. thanks very much indeed. So uh, overall the uh, endorsement of the report and uh, able to move on but I think we should also take Mark's point as well into uh, into being as we see how important uh, uh, situations and it's, it's a changing situation as well uh, yes it's it is it's critical and it is moving along what 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 I propose is that um, I think we will not uh, we'll keep an eye on the situation We'll continue to look at this, and when we bring this back in, in December as part of the broader strategic transport plan, um, uh, we'll just confirm that before this becomes part of the statutory document as part of the strategic transport plan, we'll confirm back with the board that, um, uh, that that's still the intention, if that's okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I certainly think that we should be concentrating on the areas of transport for the north rather than trying to sort of enunciate on what would be national politi uh, policies and uh, runway capacity certainly comes into that category. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Can we then move on to uh, item number nine uh, now uh, to um, the Rail North Committee update? Um, Martin, are you going to start it off and then Liam will come in on that? But, uh, the meeting which was scheduled for the 13th of uh, September for very obvious reasons did not take place um, but there were there have been discussions uh, since then Martin um, thank you chairman and, and and as you say we'll do a bit of a double act this time instead of David and uh, councillor Robinson it'll be myself and, and councillor Robinson um, I'll just kind of give you a flavor of the briefing that uh, uh, the rail north committee members have some of whom were uh, on the call um, if we can kind of take the current situation uh, members were uh, had an update from uh, the directors of Avanti um, they were told in that conversation and I think it related to an announcement that the company made around about the same time that they that Avanti see that they will uh, are committing themselves to having their full timetable back by the December timetable change. Um, Northern they heard how uh, progress is being made. Um, reasonable uh, reasonable picture there at the moment. Still some headwinds around uh, the impact of the industrial relations, but uh, not too bad a picture. They heard also from TransPennine um, about how um, the the step back in timetable on the West Coast, they hope to start reintroducing those services before uh, December, but again, a little bit of that is about uh, impact of um, uh, headwinds, I think was the phrase that people were using in terms of um, the, uh, the impact on driver training and availability, but certainly a commitment from Tra TransPennine to restore those services as quickly as possible. I think what came across in the briefing was this crucial issue, and I think uh, Mayor Driscoll touched on it earlier, about actually having a bigger driver pool that the operators can draw upon and um, uh, again Mayor Driscoll talked about it and it's something I think Rail North Committee wants to be championing in fact I think this board should be championing the idea of establishing the Rail Academy which is part of uh, a proposal it's not yet funded uh, within the business plan but a proposal nonetheless to establish such a facility in the north to actually help in the, in the address the more medium and longer term uh, ambition um, 
We also heard through the conversations around preparations for the December timetable change, and, and I know talking to Tim Shoveler from Network Rail, I think the sense was, I know we're all uh, very mindful of the impact when things went wrong in May 18. I think the message this time is December 22 is a different beast. Uh, it is not so heavily dependent upon major infrastructure on the scale that the pros was previously, nor is it was dependent upon the scale of um, introduction of new rolling stock that was accompanying that May timetable. Irrespective of that, myself and the team, we've been working uh, and making sure on your behalf that uh, where those plans are being taken forward, they're being prodded and poked. Uh, I think the kind of observation was the, uh, they've not been, uh, we've all learnt from May 18 and been uh, exercising a level of scrutiny that um, is actually absolutely right. Again, all subject to um, the, the impact of headwinds that might come as a consequence of industrial relations. But I think in terms of what is controllable, myself and the team are kind of satisfied that the industry, both from Network Rail and um, uh, from uh, the operator are doing absolutely everything they can do. Uh, we've also been working, and I've had correspondence with, with Tim, around making sure that the issues, particularly around Earlham Station, are addressed as quickly as possible, as I know that is a particular issue which we need to address. So um, I think that's kind of trying to summarise where we are. Um, but, Councillor Robertson, if you want to just to give a perspective as the chair of the group. Yes, yeah, certainly. Well, do. Thanks, Martin. Thanks for um, presenting uh, a report that's effectively condensed the whole committee agenda into a few pages. So really well done uh, to yourself and David for, for pulling that together. I think for me, there's two very important points within this report that we've got to maintain our focus on. One is around the current operational performance of, be it, of Anti, TPE, Northern, as well as, as part of that. Um, that I know actually attendees today have been caught up in just today, uh, for example. Um, the reasons for all of that, as the report p points out, is mixed, but I do think it's important for us to point out just to blame singularly industrial action is frankly dishonest. You know, it's a much more mixed picture, and as you rightfully point out, the dearth of trained train drivers, which is a national shortage, is one of the key reasons that sits behind that. Whilst the current level of service is completely unacceptable, and we need to kind of make sure that is continually pointed out, it's an absolute nonsense when we look at the service reductions that the north of England and, and localities within the north are facing. It's absolutely vital that the train operators now deliver the kind of commitments that they've given us in terms of returning to the service portfolio that they're proposing. And I would go as far to say, on public record in this forum now, that if those targets that they've committed to are not met, that's the means for the individuals and the companies that have made those commitments, their positions will be untenable. You know, it's absolutely vital they deliver on the commitments that they've given to the north of England. The second point I was going to raise specific to the report as well uh, references uh, the productive meeting that myself and Patrick had uh, with the previous Rail Minister, Wendy Morton, pointing out uh, where we were up to with rail issues across the north, but particularly raising the vital importance of making sure that the North Railway is appropriately funded and we don't end up with the funding gaps that are likely emerging for, uh, for Northern and Transpennine Express because unless those funding gaps are closed, that will translate into two things. One, it will be services that um, were withdrawn around the time of the pandemic not being reintroduced, but just as worse, potentially further services and frontline services being cut, neither of which are acceptable to any of us in this room and particularly not acceptable to the travelling public of the north of England. So for me, those are the two most important points to pull out of this report, but there are, of course, other issues regarding in the East Coast Mainline, Manchester Recovery Task Force and, and so forth. I'm sure members will want to question the debate now. Thank you. Thanks, Liam. Um, I don't quite know why it is that the last two rail ministers have gone on to become chief whips. Um, <laughs> not whether there's uh, any uh, coincidence in that. But uh, uh, Andy first, um, and then uh, others. So I appreciate um, uh, Martin's update. Um, but how can I put it? I'm not at all sanguine that they're doing everything that they can. Um, what I see is people are losing confidence in rail travel in a very serious way in our part of the world right now. 
this week, trying to get to Liverpool. Was it Monday morning, Tuesday morning? Just terrible cancellations. Left, you know, I was an hour on the platform at Newtonley Willows. People missing meetings, general chaos. And but that's just a, you know, just a, a snapshot. It's all of the time, cancellations, left, right, and centre. Um, I don't know if it's just us or whether others are, are seeing this, but this is this is our our daily experience. I have a daughter at Liverpool University, so she's always on those, and it's just terrible. And it actually affects people's safety as well because sometimes late night trains are just just taken out. I mean, it's just nowhere near good enough. And I, I just were going to press you, Martin. You really believe they're doing everything they can? Because I don't think so. So the, the argument they sell to us is. We're going to reduce the timetable so that we can make it more resilient. <laughs> Honestly, the Avanti situation, I'm afraid, just disproves that. They reduced it, and it's still awful. Um, and as you know, the, the Transport Commissioner for Greater Manchester could not get here uh, today for a media launch because the key service out of London cancelled at the last minute. And it's it's not, it honestly isn't anywhere near good enough, as far as I'm concerned, to be four years on from what we experienced in, in May 18, and it's not really got much better. They had the pandemic, which they told us would be breathing space to sort things out, and now they use that as an excuse that it was disruptive of their... I mean, which is it? I mean, I, so I, I, I'm afraid to say I, don't, I do not have a sanguine view about this at all. I don't think they're doing everything they can. If I give you the, exam the Avanti experience in the summer, I had a series of meetings with them. They did try and say it was all the unions, nothing to do with them. Twice, which we didn't accept, and we think we were right not to accept. We asked them to take measures like declassify the trains, L at least give people a chance of getting a seat to London. They didn't, and there are multiple reports of people having to pay more to get into standard premium or, or first. The lack of staff on train. Honestly, I, I don't think it's anywhere near acceptable, and I don't think there's been a recognition of it actually fully uh, in the media that this is every day of this damages the economy of this city that you are all in. Every day of it, and we're, said, we're told that December is good enough. And as I understand it, December, with a few extra trains randomly thrown in, Tuesdays and Thursdays or something, you know, that isn't good enough to us at all. Now, I don't know what the view of TFN is, but I can say for certain the leader of this council and myself uh, are not accepting what, what they're putting forward. Um, I guess I want to know was what is TFN's view? Are you all happy? You know, is, is that the view that it is okay and they're doing everything they can? Well, you know, it's not our view. There's a decision about to be taken by the government as to whether or not there's a renewal of a contract. I think it's an October decision. Um, I was waiting to see what the rescue plan was to, to try and give them, if it had been two trains per hour in October, or was it, you know, two in November, then three in, or I, I don't know, it, we were open-minded, but to get nothing clear until December is, isn't good enough. And it's not just Avanti, is it, on the West Coast Main Line, it's TPE, as Martin said, so the same story, we're going to remove services, it will make it better, but it doesn't. And I'll finish on this point. It's one company, it's First Group. First Group are letting down this city and the north of England in a, in a spectacular fashion. So do we have trust in first group to run rail services in this part of the world? Because they are not, they have not handled this at all right. To hide behind industrial action when they knew there were serious management problems at that company, it's, it's not open, it's not transparent, it's not accountable, it's not good enough. So I'm sorry to be blunt, but it's, it's too important to this city to, to be anything other. They're damaging us. They have damaged us. We lost visitors at Manchester Pride and all kinds of big events that have happened. Uh, Vernon Everett, our transport commissioner, is, is, was in a, an investor event in London yesterday, and people were saying, we're not sure we can invest with the transport. 
this is too serious to just to pass over. There need to be better answers, and I think TFN needs to decide what is it saying about Avanti West Coast publicly. It, does it support the renewal of that contract, or does it not? And if it, if it does support it, what conditions are being applied to that renewal? It's too loose at the moment. They're getting away with too much. They're getting a get out of jail free card because no one's properly holding them to account, and they need to be held to account. They're letting passengers and businesses down, and they're letting. They're le I think they're letting our, not just us down. I think they're letting everybody down. And I'm afraid we need to get back into the mode that we were in in May 2018 because it's it's seriously not good enough. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Andy. I, I I would let some of us come in, and then we'll uh, t take a, a view of a, a, a sum up later on. I mean, I. I I fully understand where Andy's frustration and annoyance because he's had repeated assurances which have just not been uh, delivered and uh, it is not the service that is, uh, was uh, originally promised um, and uh, I well understand the, the debate of December uh, that everything would be sort of all, all restored by December is still too far away. Uh, Mark first and then I think I saw some others did did I? Yeah, Mayor Driscoll, Charlie and the, yeah, okay. Okay, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, it's, it's just an anecdotal comment, really. I've been on um, <clears throat> the three northern operators this week, um, and out of all of them, Avanti were the worst. Uh, the others were actually pretty good uh, from the travelling experience I had, and, but Avanti were just atrocious. Well, yeah, thank you for that. I think uh, a lot of what Andy's had to say sort of reflects the, the feeling of people, that they let down the North feel. Basically, we, we've got to try and recover and, and get our economy up, up and running again, and we let down time and time again. I think, uh, from, come to my mind, is forward planning comes to things. You've got, you've got companies have got contracts to deliver a service when they know the timetable before they pick the contract up and then don't deliver on it and then uh, say it's somebody else's fault, not theirs. But aren't they managing things? Aren't they planning it? Did they not see they're going to be short-staffed? Short they know they've got to deliver so many services, they haven't got the people or resources to deliver it. They must know that in advance and put plans in place. But it's a question of, in the north, you've got to just take the pain, grin and bear it, and there might be something better in the future. We don't know when it's going to be in the future and what it's going to look like. But we seem to become second best each and every time in this side. So I think it's about time we did stand up and did say, we deserve, and the people of the north deserve, a better service than what we're getting. And we at least stick to the contracts that, that you sign. Mayor Driscoll. Thanks. Andy's spoken eloquently and passionately, um, and I think sums up the frustration of everybody um, in this room. This morning I was trying to get from Liverpool here, checked the train last night, because everybody in my organisation is reluctant to travel across the north on the train. And I talk to investors, and I've had exactly the same comments. Is your transport system up to it? That's out there. It's, it's affecting confidence in the north at the moment. And it does seem to be peculiar because the, there are issues across the rail system. We've spoken about a lot of them. But uh, LNER aren't getting the trains cancelled the way Transpennine Express are. It's roughly 50% every time you look, and at short notice, um, event it doesn't operate for the northeast. And the excuse of industrial relations doesn't wash for two reasons. One, everybody wants better industrial relations, and it requires people to get together and form a solution. And it doesn't wash because the Tynanwea Metro and Merseyrail have solved their problems and have reached an agreement. It is possible where there is a will to do it. So I think Andy's right, and I echo his comments, and I think we do have to take a decision about the message we sent out. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I would just, I think I need to reiterate the point that I've made before at Rail North Committee. And I've got a phrase which is, you cannot pour from an empty cup. And I do feel that to kind of fritter away the industrial relations nightmare that we've had this summer 
as just an excuse for the operators, I think in itself is disingenuous. There is only so much one management system of an organisation can do. And if their focus is on industrial relations, it's not on focusing on the things that we're talking about here in terms of passenger confidence, reliability, investor support and confidence. I am firmly of the belief that this summer has been a devastation for the rail industry and the unions have a major role to play in that, as do the operators, and I've said that all along, that it's the operators as well. But the, I would just like to ask anyone who speaks to trade unions, and I know that a few colleagues in this room do often have conversations with, more conversations with trade unions than, than I do, is can you ask them to concentrate their industrial action in the south of England, if that's where you really want if you, let's let's get the unions to focus on going on strike down there rather than rather than up here. If 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 you're serious about this, if you're serious about the north, then you've got to take a better stand on these industrial actions. I really I I cannot say this enough. Where where's your view on the unions and the operators? That's where we need to get to. Is we need to have a really robust positive, proactive future for the rail, and that involves, industrial action has not helped. We are pouring from an empty cup, and yes, this cup's got holes been stabbed in it from every angle, I get that, but we literally need to find a solution. It's October now, next week, and there's still no solution to this. Operators, unions, got to get back round the table, and they've got to fix it. I think you've stimulated some debate, or you will be. Uh, I've got Andy wanting to come back in, in well, a second. Just, just I, to, I don't, uh, okay, Andy, come back in. Just now. briefly. I mean, I, 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 I think we try not, don't we, just to take party political positions in, in here. Uh, and in the summer, when I wrote to the previous transport secretary, I said I'm prepared to help. Help. I wrote with the mayor of London, and we we, we can maybe talk to the unions to the extent that it's there issue. We got a letter back that said it's all the unions, but it's not all the unions. And I'm sorry, Charlie, it, it, that is not an accurate description of, of the situation. Let me explain to you very clearly why it isn't and why I don't think what you've just said is, is actually a, 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 a kind of considered uh, view. If it was, we would, what we've got is a reduced timetable, one train an hour from Manchester. And that's chaotic. So it's nothing to do with industrial action. What they've reduced it down to is chaotic. So you and I will have a different view about why it's got down to that point, because it's nothing to do with industrial action. It's rest day working that's been with, that, that people aren't doing. That happens in the summer on the railway. I think there's actually an issue for the Department for Transport, which is the straitjacket they're putting companies into in these new contracts. I am told that Virgin, for all of its years, and we all know who used it, it was a better service, they had more money to cover the rest day working issue. They, they had more money to play with. But the new regime does not give that more money to play with. So I think you need just, I think, to kind of see the... It's too easy to say it's all... It's not. If it was all the unions, this one train an hour would be running well and they'd have got the resilience back into it and it would be fine, but it isn't. This is largely a major management uh, failure. But it may be, I think, that the regime from the department has got a hand in it. And possibly the unions have a, a hand in it as well. The solution probably lies within all three. But let's call it really correctly, because if we don't call it correctly, we won't get to the heart of it and we won't get, get a solution. But the bottom line is the unions have got nothing to do with them not being able to run a, a threadbare timetable, which is what they've not been doing since August. See the others? You've got Craig Brown. C Craig uh, and Liam. And Keith. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, th thank you. You okay? Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, uh, I don't have a party p political position to take, uh, but what I will do is endorse uh, the comments that I've heard from all of the, uh, the previous speakers. I'm in a I was in a fortunate position of not having to travel uh, last Monday 
but I'm told by my residents that four services between crew, locally stopping services between crew and Manchester Piccadilly were cancelled between the hours of 6.30 and 8.30 in the morning. Now, these are not leisure time services. They're services that honest men and women rely on to get to work. So I do have to agree, sadly, that I don't think enough is being done. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, I know there's a lot of frustration. Um, I've been with this organisation now for 10 years, um, since 2012, I think it was 2011 when I first joined. Uh, the situation is absolutely worse. It's, it's dreadful. I've never known uh, in my work in life, and I worked in industries that were seven day a week jobs, having an agreement where people have to work the rest days to make the system work. I mean, how, how long can this go on with these kind of industrial relations? Uh, and if the government doesn't get themselves involved, because this is a government system we're running here, if they don't get themselves involved, it's going to fail dramatically. We can criticise the operators uh, as much as we like, uh, and we have done in, this, in, in these chambers uh, over many years, and many di some directors have actually uh, left their jobs. Um, but Network Rail have a big role to play in this as well. They have to get their infrastructure right, because many trains are now being cancelled because of infrastructure failures. I was travelling from the last audit committee that I was in in, in, in uh, Manchester back home to Cumbria, just requiring one train out of Piccadilly or, uh, and to Carlisle. The train was stopped in Preston and 200 and odd people were put off the train in Preston TPE because there was a line failure north of Carlisle near Carstairs. The next train came in was Avanti who discharged another 200 people onto the platform. There wasn't a soul in uniform to be seen to, spe to speak to us, no, no messages. Why don't these trains just travel up to Carlisle where they could have got the vast majority of people at least within 50 miles of Glasgow? Uh, I don't understand it. I really don't understand it. And the rail industry needs to get its act together. Turning t 400 people out in Preston at, at 4 o'clock on a Friday evening doesn't do anybody any good or anybody any credibility. Um, and it isn't only the operators. It's network rail as well that need to get their act together. I am slightly um, sort of looking at the clock a bit, but I, I do realise that this is a very important uh, conversation to have. Uh, I've got uh, Nick, Liam, and uh, North Lincolnshire as well. Can we have uh, Nick, Nick Ross first? Mick, Mick Ross. Mick Ross, sorry. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so um, I appreciate, obviously, we both time, but also that this is looking as Transport for Norfolk strategic issues, but I want to raise an issue of last weekend that happened over in our neck of the woods where uh, Northern announced that due to uh, um, engineering works, a do not travel notice uh, because they didn't have the buses. And that is not good enough, and the fact that that was announced the day before is not good enough. And I do think that Transport for the North, as well as having a strategic out, uh, outlook, needs to have a view on this sort of issue as well, and actually be making clear that that situation is just not good enough. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Liam? Yeah, thanks very much. I, I want to helpfully pick up Charlie's cup about industrial relations and see how we might be able to pour out some reality and, and truth around it, because, yeah, you're absolutely right, Charlie. I'm one of those people who regularly talks to the rail trade unions. Very proud of that. That's part of my working background. But I also speak to senior people in the train operating companies as well. And I think genuinely, both sides do want to get around the table. Both sides do want to find uh, a negotiated settlement to all manner of the industrial relations challenges across the, the country. The reality, the difficulty that both sides tell me is it's the Department for Transport that hasn't given them the flexibility to get round that table and cut the appropriate deals. Particularly around short-term rest-day working uh, agreements, that's the practical reality, because at the moment, 
The train operators have to effectively go back to the DFT for sign-off on any deal. And that's the reality around it. Now, the, pre the previous Secretary of State, it appeared, didn't want to give that latitude to get round the table and allow those agreements to, uh, to sort of come forward. We can only hope, and our key role is to lobby the new Secretary of State and all the way up to the Prime Minister to say this is causing not just the north of England but the whole of the country real transport but more fundamentally economic pain and we need to find a negotiated settlement to this dispute. But government is absolutely crucial to all of that and they need to quite frankly allow both sides the opportunity to get round the table and find a suitable agreement. Otherwise we'll be sat here next time and the time after that and the time after that lamenting this situation. That, as far as I understand, where I pick up your cup and tip out the, the reality is exactly where the culpability lies at this moment in time. Thanks, Liam. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Chairman. Um, 40 years ago, when I worked in the private sector, I didn't have rest days. I worked a seven-day rotor. For 33 years, I was in the fire and rescue service. I didn't have rest days that had to be negotiated. I worked on a rotor. I'm stunned that any organization in a seven-day society as we are now can still be arguing over rest day working and I would urge both sides to come together and get that sorted out so that we've got some resilience right across a calendar week it absolutely needs to be done as a matter of priority and that's going to need a dose of goodwill on both sides I, 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 I buy that entirely. Sunday working has always been a, a problem as far as the rail industry is concerned, subject to separate or, uh, uh, negotiations. Uh, t Tim, do you want to uh, cover some of the points as well? Thank you. Well, I, um, as the train operators aren't here, but for Network Rail and uh, as a sort of senior member of the rail industry, it's, it's obviously a terrible thing to have to sit here um, and hear some of the comments that, that, that I've heard. Um, none of it is a surprise, of course. I, th I think I can say in my 35 or well, 30 odd years now of running railways one way or another, um, this last few months has been undoubtedly the most chaotic, the most disrupted, the most frustrating for all of us, for passengers, for our staff, and for the leaders in the industry. No one thinks this is a good place. No one is uh, thinking this is in any way acceptable um, or sustainable, because every day there are clearly pressures on the network um, and as we approach the autumn, when we all know that's a challenging enough time as it is, that of course the major projects that we've got planned, all of those things become harder in this environment. I'm leading for Network Rail the work with the trade unions to, um, to modernise our industrial relations practices um, and to, to find a way of making an affordable pay award, which is absolutely what we're committed to doing. And as you know, there was a, a, a very substantial offer put on the table back in July before these first strikes started. Um, if, 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 I take this as a personal comment, if you will. Um, the thing I'm absolutely convinced about is the railway can only work well when it all works together. I've never seen an example of a railway that works well when we're not having positive relationships with our employees. Most of our staff work unsupervised most of the time. It therefore goes without saying that actually if there is uh, if there is not a positive environment in which people are wishing and able to work, able to work, then of course that's going to affect train performance and it's going to affect people's willingness to volunteer to, do the, to go the extra mile and very often our people do. We demonstrated during the, the period of mourning that as an industry we can come together and with the exception of one train company, all the other train companies uh, and Network Rail were able to run a normal service so that we could play our part in helping the company pay its respects. And yet the infrastructure is still the same. The people are still the same. I think that illustrates very clearly to me just what the underlying issues are at the moment. So I think absolutely the focus must be in the short term. We have to continue making sure that the, you know, the, 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 the train operators and with the network rail planning team are providing really good information when trains are cancelled, that as far as possible, uh, that, that when trains are not going to be running, that they are spaced out, and albeit that is very restrictive based on roster patterns and people's willingness to move off the roster pattern. The contingency forms of transport in place. We ran some charter trains and it were rail hired some charter trains during the period of mourning. Um, I think that's a first to make sure that people could get to where they needed to go. It's a new stopgap. But absolutely the main focus has to be 
to continue working with the trade unions, with government, with all the other parties involved, so that we can find a way of getting back onto a, an affordable solution to the, under, to the underlying industrial relations issues. So, um, Chair, I'm sorry, I know you want to sum up. I, I, when I accept that, and I listen very carefully to you, and I, and I think I'm not going to disagree. I think we all would dis disagree, uh, all would agree with that. But there is a, it can't be allowed to take us away from a question, which is, does this company that is currently operating the West Coast Main Line deserve the right to continue to operate the West Coast Main Line? I'm taking on board all of the wider context, which I accept, and we all accept, but there is still clearly internal management failure going on in that specific organisation. And I'm asking you as Chair, what is the position of TFN about that? Would, can TFN support almost just sort of letting it be rolled over? Or would you be prepared to consider supporting the call for Manchester City Council and Greater Manchester Combined Authority for a much tougher test as to whether or not they can, you know, they, they should be giving us at least two trains an hour, um, I would, well I would say by, by October and November, and then we go to three, and, you know, without a predictable timetable through the autumn, I don't see how, in my view, we can, we can accept their, their continued uh, uh, holding of this contract, but I'd just would be grateful Jeff, if you could sum up and s just see if you could help us on that issue. Thanks, uh, Andy. I will try and sum up. I, I, I think there's, there's, there are separate issues here. There is the disruption which is caused by industrial action, uh, and I think uh, the point that Charlie makes is, is a valid point about uh, there does, at the end of the day, need to be a solution. The new Secretary of State has already met the rail unions, uh, which was a break from her predecessor's uh, particular position. I think uh, the position, though, that Andy refers to is actually the service which has been given by Avanti, leaving aside industrial relations, uh, the industrial dispute, because the service that Avanti has given has been chopped and at ridiculous levels. I mean, one train an, uh, an hour from Manchester is just something which is basically two, two thirds down on what, on what it was and, and is an unacceptable position. So, in the report, you will see at page 116, we have got that uh, uh, chapter 3.4 there, which says that the uh, deal with Avanti is due to be reviewed by the Department of Transport in mid October. Uh, I think, given the, this debate, I need to write on behalf of Transport to the North to the Department saying that we do need a much, much tighter uh, recovery plan uh, with more details, and that should be worked out with the local authorities, in, uh, particularly in Manchester, as being as that is the city which has been most directly cut. I think probably cut the hardest of all the cities they serve, I would imagine. I, I wouldn't think. Uh, um, Birmingham or, uh, or, or the other cities are, or even Liverpool has been cut slightly to the way that Manchester has and to endorse uh, what Mayor Burnham has said as far as the unacceptability of the service is concerned. I, I think we need to do that and see what develops from the new Secretary of State as a way of uh, moving forward. Um, but I, I think the point that Joe makes is a, a wider point across the industry as a whole, but I think some of the service cuts, and, and it does come back down to this, what I said earlier on. It is the, 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 the way in which services are cancelled at very short notice, which actually does the most damage, not just to those companies, but to the confidence that passengers have as to whether they can rely on the railway system or not. And it is tragic that we are in the situation that we find ourselves in at the moment. And th there are reasons for it. There are some of the reasons about failure of training during the time of the pandemic, which has put extra pressures on. I do understand all that, but uh, even so, some of these issues have been known about for a, fa a fair time, uh, and that was known about when contracts were taken in. So if that uh, meets with the approval of the uh, board, then that's what we'll do. We'll write uh, following this, uh, but asking that uh, the department bear in mind the very serious concerns about the lack of services into Manchester. Martin wants to just add one thing. 
Uh, if I might, Chair and, and meeting, um, can I just suggest you include in that also and pick up on the point from Councillor Robinson about making a request for our, our, our northern operators to be given the flexibility to look at some of these challenges, because I think that is something that the Rail North Committee, I think, is aware of and has picked up on. And I think if you're going to be writing about how can we solve some of these problems in the north, I would suggest you include that as part of your message. Okay, I think everyone's in it. Okay, that's fine. We are slightly running late, but I would like to, while we've still got the numbers, it's quite important that we do the next uh, few items, not least the annual accounts and corporate risk, uh, and uh, the, also the organisational update. Uh, so, um, Paul, can I quickly ask you to uh, introduce these, and then I think Keith's going to do so as well. Thank you, Chair. Um, I trust and hope this will be a little less contentious than the previous item. Um, the papers are extensive, but uh, it is a matter that's been retained by the Board, the approval of the accounts. Um, and whilst they are extensive, I'll take them as being read. Um, there is one matter that, uh, that, is, uh, that I'd like to bring to your attention. The, the external auditors normally, uh, well, sorry, not normally, the external auditors require the GMPF, which is our Great Adventure the Pension Fund, to be signed off prior to them signing off our own accounts. Uh, we had envisaged that would be in place by this meeting, but we've been advised now that it will be October. Uh, we don't think this is a bit to be a problem with it. There hasn't been in previous years. So we were suggesting that the uh, recommendation gets adjusted to, to be um, that you would approve the accounts subject to the receipt of the, uh, the sign-off of the pension fund and it requiring no changes to the accounts that you have in front of you. Uh, if there are any modifications required and there is a possibility that could be required, then we would, go, we would repeat the process and go through ANG committee again and bring it to the board in, in November. Um, the board will probably be aware of the fact that they've delegated the oversight of the financial um, uh, matters of the, of, the, of the company to, to the ANG committee, and a key part of that is the, the chair's report, which is part of the papers. So I'd like to just invite the, um, the, the vice chair, but also the, the interim chair for a part of the year, uh, Council Little, to uh, highlight some key areas of the report. Uh, thank you, Paul, uh, and colleagues. Um, we will recall that uh, throughout the year we've, we, uh, we lost our uh, finance officer uh, and Paul uh, thankfully was there and, and had been able to step up and, and he's come doing the role at the moment. So I'll thank Paul for his work and, and his team on behalf of the committee and also to Julie and her team in the governance uh, for their support uh, and of course the members of this committee who form part of our committee as well. So the report and appendices are colleagues on pages uh, 127 to 136 of the pack detail the remit and delivery of the Audit and Governance Committee. Appendix 4 on page 135 captures the terms of reference, how the committee have delivered against these terms. In particular, the committee have reviewed the annual governance statement, reviewed the statutory accounts, received regular feedback from the external auditors on progress of the external audit, and ensure TFN have comply, uh, complied with the statutory public inspection period. Recommended that the accounts for approval subject to the receipt of the pension sign-off letter and no changes to the accounts. Paul's already explained that. Um, and also uh, agreed an internal audit plan, track the progress against its delivery, and assured itself that the effectiveness of the inter internal controls Elevated risk to a standing item and assured itself through regular challenges uh, to the effectiveness, effectiveness of the risk management uh, regime. To close, I would like to reiterate the recommendations as detailed in section 2 on page 121. To approve the annual account statement, approve the statutory accounts for the year ending March 2022 subject to there being no modifications from the version approved today arising from the sign-off of the TFN Pension Fund. I so move, Chair. Uh, thank you. Have we got a second for that? Thank you, Hans. Uh, is everybody in favour of that? Okay, thank you very much. In um, then, uh, Corporate Risk Register. Paul, have you got anything you want to add to that? Nothing really, just to say that it's there for information purposes to keep the board abreast of the, the key risks and, and the way that they're being managed and the fact that it's uh, an area that is subject to significant scrutiny by the ANG committee as evidenced in the report. Okay, thank you. Can I have approval of that, please? Thank you. 
Um, Martin, uh, organisational design update and governance. Um, Chair, um, you've got the report before you. You've got an update in terms of where we are with the senior management structure and the director level recruitment. The two things that we are asking you as a board to agree: one is to uh, allow, uh, agree that the, there should be a subcommittee of the general purposes committee to oversee the actual recruitment of the uh, section 151 officer. That then would be available for us to use if there were any other uh, statutory officers to be appointed in the future. And secondly, just to delegate the objectives setting for the TFA. And Chief Executive, again, to the General Purposes Committee. Those are the two specific things that we're asking for your uh, support for. Indeed. Um, uh, Julia, have we covered everything we need to get agreement for? Very quickly, though. I think so, Chairman. <laughs> yes, Good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you very much indeed. This, by the way, is the, uh, although Dawn is not here with us, uh, absolutely uh, present. I know she's uh, looking in, but Dawn Madden, who has been with the uh, Transport for the North ever since its uh, conception and set up, it's her last meeting. I'd like to uh, formally put place on record my thanks and appreciation to the work that she's done over a very long period. So, Dawn. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, the date and the time of the next meeting is Wednesday the 14th of December and there have been a few things that uh, we've agreed to this morning which we'll want to properly discuss at that which may be new items to the agenda not least the Convention of the North which will take place at the end of uh, January. So uh, can I thank everyone for their attendance and we'll take a short break. Partnership now. board quarter to two in here. Uh, partnership board is in 30, 30 minutes time in here. Thank you very much indeed. Cheers.